Hello and welcome, I'm Centropedes, and today we're going to be playing a new game. So we're going to be trying out um, a game called Vagrus the Riven Realms. Um, I have played this game a bit. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, brilliant, uh, kind of immersive, narrative, um, party management game, I suppose, trading game. There's a lot to it, but we'll go through um, some of that today. We are going to be playing uh, the prologue, um, playing through that because it's really quite rich um in story and setting uh what we're going to do is i'm going to play you the intro video now uh because i think it's worthwhile watching it's pretty awesome and uh it gives us a lot of setting for this so i'll turn off my um video input uh just for this so you can uh, feel fully immersed and then i'll press play for us The River Realms, they call it. What a fine poetic name for something as rotten and twisted as our land has become. It was not always so. Long ago, the old empire, the noblest and most enduring society created by humankind, spanned almost the entire continent of Zerin, the cradle of man. But after several millennia of progress and incomparable achievements, Inevitably, the Empire began to fall into stagnation and decadence. Desperately holding on to their privileges and resisting change while trying to avert the collapse of the realm, the Emperor and his theocracy took to measures that were worthy of true despots in cruelty. Subjugating weaker realms, enslaving whole nations, strip mining foreign resources, Pressing imperial citizens, war on several fronts, genocide. Eventually the gods could no longer tolerate such horrors wrought in their name. Foretold by an abundance of divine omens, they descended upon the Empire to right its wrongs. Thus, in a chain of dreadful events that became known as the Calamity, they annihilated the Empire in a matter of days. The gods then finally saw what they had done in their anger and confusion. It is said that so much grief and shame filled them that they were broken and they left this reality, never to return. The continent and its inhabitants seemed dead, but at length survivors began to crawl out of their hiding holes and faced a land that no longer welcomed them. Arcane anomalies, the fallout of the calamity, now riddled the continent and people realized that they had to share their new home with changed and twisted creatures. <laughs> Terrible beings entered through the cracks in the tapestry of reality and rose to rule over the natives. In time, these new powers rebuilt the fallen empire in their own image, and the river realms, now godless and vengeful, reincarnated from the ashes. The inhabitants of the land, such as I, now eke out a living under the crushing rule of the new empire. The continent itself constantly resists our every attempt at building a cozy home for ourselves. As travel is dangerous, many ventures specialize in transferring cargo and passengers over bleak and deadly leagues of land. Others try to take everything of value from said travelers, or attempt to find buried treasures among the ruins of the old empire. The leaders of the endeavors are, some say, the bravest men and women of the river realms. Such a leader is called a Vagras. Okay, so hopefully you managed to uh, watch that. Obviously some people having some problems. 
But um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of give a summary really. I wanted to play that because it gives a, a great background to the what is a superb kind of dystopian setting. Um, basically, uh, some terminology. So a Vagrus is like a leader of the uh, traveling group that you're a part of. Um, a Comitatus is your group, so the name for the group. Um, so we'll be using those words from now on fairly uh, easy to understand I hope there's not a, a, you know we'll go through some of the terminologies we go through but that, they're the main two things you need to know so is a brief summary of, of what uh, people's watched in the video and um, the kind of dystopian lore of the game um, it's based in around the kind of early Iron Age um, late Bronze Age uh, as if the Roman Empire um, was kind of at its height um, and it commits some atrocities against peoples across the world and um, expands enslaving other peoples blah 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 so um, in this world the gods really exist um, and they decide that the Romans or whoever it is um, have committed atrocities for long enough so they decide to destroy and punish um, the Empire in a very kind of Old Testament way um, and what that does is it, it does destroy the empire um but it unleashes um some kind of forces into the world now the gods realize that after they've destroyed the empire um that probably they they uh were a bit rash and they shouldn't have done that so they run away or they go into exile or whatever we don't know um so they leave the world as it is like destroyed with gaps in you know what they th what is presented as kind of like space time um, and what comes of that is the world's a mess. It's very dystopian and horrific. There's cre horrible creatures everywhere, and some things come through the, the gaps in reality. Um, and 12 of these creatures, um, or whatever they are, um, become take over the old empire, and they become the new empire. Um, we'll explore some more of that later on as we go through. Um, so I'm not going to give too much away now. And but what we are going to do is we're going to start our game. Uh, so we're going to play. We are going to play in wasteland mode, um, which is the normal one. So apologies if we get into a really bad situation and uh, we end up starving, um, which could genuinely happen. Um, we will see. Uh, I have played some of this already, but I'm no by, by no means an expert, um, as probably some of the streamers that you might have watched are. Um, so we will go into wasteland mode. Ah, yes. A Vagrus. What a profession. Daring and savvy. Always watching the horizon. Always looking for an opportunity. And of course, for what is best for his comitatus, eh? And you are a Vagrus too, are you not? Many of your kind have I seen in my long life as a vagabond. Care to listen to a story about your exquisite occupation, good master? It is a tale of woe and terror, but it is also a tale that is true, as I have seen it with my own eyes. So this interaction basically allows you to play the prologue or go straight into the game. Now, um, we are going to play the prologue because it's very interesting. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I haven't actually even got to the main game yet. Um, so I need a bit of time to kind of catch up. So we're going to play the prologue. Also, another thing is um, the game is very text heavy now apologies if the text is small um there was a way to change it but it didn't affect text like this that w that is pasted in um it only affects interaction text so i basically said there's no point in really doing it um what i'll do is i'll try and read out everything i know his his voice is so cool um yeah so I'd, i'm just going to read out basically everything that uh, will come up unless it's narrated by this old man uh, which is another th reason why we're playing the prologue because he reads out some stuff and um, so hopefully it won't burn me out too much but i will delve into the lore with you because i think it's really interesting i've seen a lot of other streamers play this and um like videos on youtube and stuff and they kind of skip over a lot which is fine like obviously gameplay is important if you're looking at the game to, to think about buying it but i want this to be a kind of playthrough you know we play through together um if we can get some people 
um, you know, online in the chat. We can maybe like make some decisions together um, and stuff, which would be pretty awesome. So, tells your tale, old man. Uh, it'll at least help kill the time. Wise you are, good master. My tale is of a Vargas such as yourself, but one whose fate was cursed and wrought with ill fortune. It all happened a long time ago. Ten years, maybe more. I was but a passenger, travelling rough roads and forgotten ways with this comitatus, south along the feet of the great mountains of the west. Just realised I gulped a huge bit of tea in the middle of that and probably ruined it. <laughs> okay, loading. This comitatus I speak of had fallen under hard times. Perhaps it was due to imperial harassment or unfortunate decisions, or simply bad luck. Era Franz, saint of Rhodes, does not always smile on us mere mortals. But however it came to pass, their coin was drying up, and their opportunities seemed few and far between. One of the last chances their Vagras saw was to travel to the remote town of Scrapheap and spend their remaining funds to stock up on cheap scrap metal. This metal could be sold for great profit over in the East and South. It wasn't a bad plan, truly, but it was not without risks either. Okay, so we're getting into the game now. A lot of the main um, part of the early game is scripted uh, narrative, which is fine. We will be able to make some decisions. But after a while, even though it is the prologue, it's very um, uh, decision-based and, and you can, you know, mess up or... Do as well as you please. So welcome to there's but there's a lot of these notifications now. Some of them I'll read out. Some of them are unnecessary because they're explaining how to play the game. So this one we don't need this because it's just saying, you know, this is the tutorial. Um, read the text, blah blah blah. So we'll skip most of this. This is just saying that you can click on this little icon to to show it up, but we we don't need this. Uh, so, I will read through this one. On the campaign map, your Comitatus uh, always occupies a node. So, the way we move through the game is we travel along these nodes, um, which take up movement points, um, which are up here. So, these are the movement points. Um, we also have march points. I'll explain those later on. Uh, this will... Uh, well, I'll explain that later on as well, but there's no point in going into it now. Uh, there's a few important things that we need to know, which will probably be explained again, but I'll go through them quickly now while we've got this screen. So um, this is your morale, which is very important to keep high uh, as your comitatus is affected by high and low morale. This is your slave obedience. Um, not as important to be high, but you must keep it above three, otherwise problems can happen. This is vigor, probably the most important statistic. Well, maybe morale is important, but this if this gets low, then you will start getting some real uh, problems in combat. This is nutrition. Um, your food level, uh, although it's very hard to actually get it very high. Cargo space, how much supplies we have, depending on the people we have. Offensive and defensive combat, which we won't use these two statistics until a lot later on. This icon just means that we are we need a few more fighters for that amount of people we have, but we probably won't be able to get rid of this icon for quite a long time because money is going to be very tight move to scrap heap so we click on the node and we just travel there oh, okay so it's again this um, little thing here is just telling us what we're gonna do so having gone ahead of the column with a handful of scouts you watch from afar as your comitatus slowly trudges along broken terrain making its way south ponderously among dormant geysers all around you the hills smolder lazily in the perpetual twilight but you're right, the Avic's voice resonates with sympathy as he appears next to you on the ridge. You nod slowly, but do not look at him, your gaze lost in the distance, where ash cloaks the horizon and the towering mountains to the south and west. You turn to your comes, um, I think that is like a position, um, so he must be like second in command or something like that, and notice supportive smile. You and Yavik have been travelling the realms together for many years now. There's no person in the world you trust more than him, except perhaps yourself. I know you feel your hands are tied, but like I said before, 
you made the right choice by leading us here. Now, I was very tempted to do kind of voices in this. I think we'll avoid that for some of the main characters, but maybe we'll do some stuff later on. And then we've got a series of options. Time will tell, but I still have my doubts. Uh, it's a long shot, you know it. There wasn't much of a choice. It's either this or trade my, <laughs> return my trading license and hang myself. It has to work. I We cannot fail. Not like this. Or thank you, but the last thing I need right now is a clumsy pep talk, even if it's well meant. Now, obviously, I don't know what all the uh, effects of these things are, but, you know, probably pissing off Yavek isn't going to be a good thing, because uh, he's an awesome character. Um... I'm probably going to just go with one of the top ones, probably this top one here. Uh, I feel like this is pretty depressing, so we'll probably avoid that. So we'll just go with this. I don't think it has much of an impact um, this early game. After a drink, you will do the voices. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yavik yeah, nods. True, but it's better than just giving up. The crew agrees too. That counts for something, no? And then we've got uh, three options again. It does, yes. Good to know they still have faith in me as their Vargas. Or perhaps they're just as desperate as I am. Doesn't change a thing. Why should I care? We're going to go with the top one again. Try and keep positive. They do have faith in you still. It should not come as a surprise since you've known and travelled with most of them for years and years. For some family members of the Comitatus, you could trust with your life. But you have heard story about the Vagri, which I think is the individual of Vargas who have been abandoned for less. Times being what they are, Yavik trails off. With the Imperials cracking down on us independence more heavily than before, business is tough, everyone knows, and they appreciate your efforts to keep us floating. Our plan ought to give us another chance. Okay, so, we get a big lore dump here. Uh, we are going to click on these things, but how much of them we'll read out, we will see. Um, also, the uh, usually the images do give you an indication of where you are. So obviously, very dystopian landscape. Um, but yeah, anyway, so in here, um, it shows us pale blue. Uh, we can click on it and have a look. Um, and these pale blue things are called codex entries. Now, codex entries are actually really important because it helps you um, <laughs> quick save the game. You're going to die in this game because you can't save in the prologue. Um, it auto saves after every day, so but there shouldn't be any crashes. It's not, it's not Dwarf Fortress. We should be okay. But yeah, good reminder. Um, yeah, until we can get into the main game, there's going to be some uh, tricky saving um, situations. We may have to quit a few times, and we'll, or we'll just ride it out. Okay, so um, the plan. You talked about your truck. You talked your travelling company into this a few weeks ago, but with each step towards the western mountains, more and more of them have doubts. Such is the way of the road, perhaps. The plan involves a desperate attempt at squeezing a low selling price for metal bits out of an old contact of yours in the town of Scrap Heap. So we're going to just click on Scrap Heap. So this is what the codex looks like. It's like a book with information in it. This is just telling us the same thing here. You can search and filter them. Unread, a blue red or gold these icons here information is supplementary you don't need to know it so scrap heap is a town on the edge of imperial territory meaning the new empire just north of the modern tongue we'll look at what that is later and south of the forest of shadows it gives us a little description um, which is pretty epic and history uh, so we'll read through these description in the smoldering shadow of a great of the great mountains of the west scrap heap rarely sees sunlight as the skies are forever ashen and overcast. The air is hot and dry. Earthquakes are common. Most of the time, Scrap Heap is engulfed in smoke and ash, and a constant reddish twilight is upon it. Surrounded by a low wall, the town is indeed made of scrap and junk, mostly stone with metal scraps, as well as leather and cloth awnings. A single tall tower stands high above the town on, the, on a hill, housing a beacon that aids scavenger teams in their return, but also gives home to the Heap King. The inhabitants wear scarves and masks to aid their breathing. Then we've got a little history, which is, we are going to read for this one because it's particularly interesting. After, well after the Calamity, people flock to the molten kingdom of Devandathar, formerly the ho homeland of all dwarves on the continent. 
So similarly to kind of Tolkien-esque uh, mythology, we have dwarves, elves, um, orcs, and humans, and some other stuff, in order to plunder any riches that remained there, especially the rare metal that's still in abundance in the kingdom. The cost of Andathar is now extremely volcanic and volatile. The scavengers did not dare dwell in it, only in its close proximity. Thus the town of Scrap Heap was born. The town is not under imperial jurisdiction, because the Empire never gave a damn about its existence out on the savage, barely inhabitable, inhabitable mountainside, and simply let gangs and comitati gather and sell the precious metals and ore in one of the border towns. Still, some trading houses set up a temporary compound there, only to get robbed and driven out months later. Scrap Heap is run by the Heap King, a gang lord who organises the previously chaotic and warring work teams. Okay. Stocking up. So it's, uh, just to remind us, the plan involves a desperate, desperate attempt uh, to go to Scrap Heap, stocking up on metal by spending your remaining coin, bringing the cargo south around the Molten Tongue to Devon by Avernum and Ash. So we're going to click on these things, so the Molten Tongue sounds interesting. The Molten Tongue is a region in western Zerin. Now, Zerin is the whole map, I believe. It's a gigantic, constantly flowing lava river. The Molten Tongue is a gigantic forking lava river that covers a vast volcanic plain and hill region at the foot of Devandathar, the Molten Kingdom. So it's now called the Molten Kingdom, the Dwarven Lands. Volcanic ash from nearby mountains covers the western sky day and night. Ash and storm clouds gather over the mountains and are lit from below by the fires among the peaks. The active volcanoes keep spitting meteors and liquid fire in the distance. Many small and large lava lakes dot the region, and the ground and stones are either covered in soot or show angry red colours. The giant lava river distorts the air from a distance, and closer to it the heat is unbearable. Then we've got a bit of history, so we'll read this as well. Before the Calamity, Devandathar was the kingdom of all dwarves on the continent, a land unmatched in technological advancements, inventions and ambition. This is ironic that in, in this game we have uh, dwarves as well, but it's one of those things. One of the oldest dwarven royal lines, kings of Devandathar, were sympathetic to humans and aided them throughout the Second Age, then became fast friends by the Third Age. The inventor kings showed early imperials the art of metalworking and stonemasonry, helped build their ancient cities, and taught them how to mine ore. Devandathar itself was abundant with metals and precious stones, so much so in fact, but in their unmatched pride, the Inventor Kings and the late Third Age forgot the wise ways of their forefathers and started refashioning their massive stone fortresses and arching bridges from iron. So they started to build everything in iron instead of stone. By the end of the age, gigantic monuments and vast cities made entirely out of metal stood among and atop the great mountains of the West. Between them, metal roads were erected high above canyons and valleys. We can probably guess what's going to happen now. When the Calamity hit, the slumbering volcanoes of Devandathar burst with cataclysmic force and melted the iron cities and roads, killing millions in minutes. So basically the whole civilization just got melted. Large rivers of lava emerged, the sky became ash and the air poison. The few that survived fled the kingdom and became a homeless, wandering, disgruntled people with no hope or future. The area east of the mountains became a no man's land of volcanic ash and lava. The many lava flows in the central mountain range and most prominent volcanoes emerge into a single giant lava river that flows east and travels leagues before gathering into the lakes of magma or slowing down and cooling. This is the Molten Tongue. So, the Molten Tongue is a giant river of lava. Not much can live near the lava formations, but that does not mean fools don't try to travel there. Due to the calamity, the land is cursed to bleed forever. So the Molten Tongue has been spilling forth for over a thousand years. Okay, and then we've got... We don't, we're not actually going to read the entry for Devon. It's just a town further down. I'll, I'll click on it, but... Basically, Devon's a town. In the south, it has uh, wraiths. Um, and the Emperor's Road. It's you know, a lot more popular. We're not going to go there for a very long time, so we're not going to bother reading through that information. We are going to read this, however. Avernum is a city, the regional capital of the Empire where the Molten Tongue reached the Smolderbone Flats. Avernum is surrounded by stone and bone walls, with watchtowers standing every 200 yards. 
the bones were carried to the site from the Plains of Bones in the south at great expense and are often carved into elaborate decorations. The houses of the city are in cramped lines, forming narrow streets and small plazas. Um, often plazas have leather and cloth awnings to shield them from fa falling and slowly gathering ash of the nearby lava rivers. Most buildings are dark brown due to the colour of stone available. An imposing stronghold called the Slag Fort, <laughs> which houses the garrison and the prefectus in its great hall, was built upon the single large hill of the south side. Large warehouses can be found pretty frequently in the outer districts of town, along with smelting forges and furnaces. Some buildings are outside the walls, typically inhabited by the poor. So, the history... we probably don't need to read this. Um, we'll kind of skim it, so... Obviously you can read it if you're quick enough. It just says here that the governor's called the Prefectus. Um, it mostly lacks a religious apparatus of some other settlements, but it's got a large military presence. Um, it follows, it's got some kind of independence. And the Prefectus uh, has his own personal army, the Avernus Legion. Blah, blah, blah. Um, one can find several forges and smithies on the main street. That's quite important for us. And then the last one is Ash, which is another town. Again, we're probably not going to go here for a while, but we'll skim it. Um, it's as far as the Imperial Road goes in the west, west, um, and people claim it the last stop of civilization. It's a hive of slaver scum and petty warlords. So it's a kind of slave town. Um, surrounded by a giant ash field. Yeah, become a slaver town. But some major imperial houses keep well-guarded trade villas there. Later on, we may be going there. There's a shortage of metal in Devon, and you know several buyers, buyers who will give a pretty price for your goods if you can only make it there before others with a similar cargo do. Such contacts are the boon of long decades spent on the road. But even if Narbo, that villain, gave you an agreeable price in scrap heap, the road is not without its perils. Sneaking through the gap between the dead forest and the molten tongue is inviting disaster so it's not a path many Vagri would risk. And of course, if this fails, you're out of alternatives. Do you think Narbo will help us out? That old scavenger was never famous for his goodwill. Nevik wonders. We just need to click on this, the Dead Forest entry. The Dead Forest uh, is a large woodland area. Um, the trees stand still, but are leafless and blackened. Gosh, there's no wind, a stifling air does not move. Black char, the remainder of green leaves, covers the ground everywhere. Nothing lives here and nothing moves except for spider-like beings in the north part of the woods that manage to spin their webs so thick that all the light is blotted out by them. Whoever touches certain dead trees comes to an unknown but presumably horrible end. Legends say these trees hold a curse that kills swiftly and uncompromisingly. Um, so it used to be the Shimmering Woods, but it got turned into the Dead Forest after the Cataclysm. Um, the Empire was in no hurry to reclaim the place, and apart from a few outposts gathering timber, nobody visits it, so not much we really need to know with that. Um, again, we're just going to click the kind of top option, um, because it's just kind of the, the friendly one. These don't really make much difference at this uh, point in the game. This part's interesting though. I'm sure such sleazy bastards as Narva would remember all the business they've ever done, Vagrus. Yavek rubs his chin absent-mindedly. You've seen this expression of his too often, not to realise he's using his sorcerous talent to read your mind. Okay, well we can go taking a peek, or get out of your head. You know the rules. Excuse me. We're going to go with the top one, uh, just try and keep it jovial. Okay. Apologies. Yavek rubs his eyes and quickly looks away. You know how it is. It comes to me so naturally, sometimes I don't know since I'm doing it. Your thoughts were loud, Vagrus. I actually have to block them, you see. After joining your Comitatus six years ago, Yavik proved to be an invaluable asset. Not only does he sense moods and thoughts around him, but he's also able to subtly manipulate others when he focuses his inner energies. It comes in handy when doing businesses. business. Then there are his other perks. A few times he saw him shatter the minds of men and beasts who tried to kill him. Not a pretty sight, but a very effective deterrence. Yet, because he's not a trained sorcerer, at least not in the traditional sense, his abilities are somewhat difficult to control. You've become accustomed to his impromptu thought scans, 
while others find it less bearable to be around him. For this reason, he's kept his abilities a secret for many years overall. This may become an issue where my first my thing blocks a bit, so I'm just going to shrink myself slightly. And what we might have to move this around, but we'll see see how we get on with that. Uh, for this reason, he's kept his abilities uh, very secret, but you can't keep secrets so long in a close-knit community of Akomitatus, especially if you keep bursting minds and knowing things you shouldn't. So there are only a handful of Comes who put up being near him for any length of time. Even so, he's not probed your mind in years, certainly not on purpose, but neither by accident. Perhaps he's in le less in control now, which suggests he's more on edge about the whole trip. Apology accepted, or just make sure it doesn't happen again. We're just going to do the top one. Uh, yep, yeah, before you go back to your Comitatus. As we were coming up to the gates of Scrapheap, this trash pile town of cutthroats and scavengers, we could see the vast mountain ranges of shattered Bivanda Thar looming ominously over the horizon, half shrouded in the gaseous vapors belched forth by the volcanoes in the far west. My companions prepared to do their business in town as fast as they could, not wishing to tarry in this notorious place. Okay, so we're just going to move straight into Scrap Heap. So we're going to get, again, a lot of kind of info dump here. Um, every time you enter into a settlement or camp, this kind of screen comes up and you get a lot of information. I'll go through it with you, um, but basically this is simple. At the moment, because we're in the very start of the prologue, we don't get given a lot of info. We just get this, and we can't really interact with a lot of the different pains that you get. Um, it can be very overwhelming when you first see it, so apologies for that, but we will get used to it. Um, it just says here, when when you enter a settlement, you can select from a different lot of options, uh, but we only have stories here. So it gives us a little description of Scrap Heap. Um, we've basically read that already, um, so we're not going to do that now. Track down Narbo. Can you be convinced to help you out? So we're just going to go straight into the story um, chain. Okay, you make your way to the red stash, stash which is the um, basically like the pub um, in this town. A notorious watering hole tucked away in a small street just beneath the imposing tower of the Heap King, but not quite under its immense shadow. You frequent the establishment, which makes it perfect for Nabo and his little operation of honest merchants. Apparently the knave is not only alive, but has done well for himself in the past decade or so. Taking only Yavek, uh, you leave the Comitatus in the care of Titus, your quartermaster, while you were gone negotiating. Ash is flitting from the black sky as you cross the street and nod to the bouncer of the wraith's stash. You give him your sidearms quietly, rules are rules, at least as long as they can enforce them. Yet they have the courtesy of allowing you to keep your dagger. And of course, they have no idea what Yavik is capable of, should it come to a scuffle. Not that you expect such a thing, but with Narbo, no one ever knows. Though you have told your crew that he and you go way back, the entrepreneur is a capricious and manipulative man who you did not part with on the best of terms. Does he remember you? Surely. Could he be persuaded to take your proposal? Who knows? Your eyes slowly adjust to the dimness of the tavern's interior. Only a few candles and a lamp at the bar illuminate the common room. Shadowy faces turn towards you and observe you through the smoke. The bartender, a thick-set man in a dirty tunic, is chewing tobacco serenely. Above the bar hangs the skeleton of a large heap lizard on display. Nabo is sitting at a table in the back, his bodyguard half hidden in the darkness of the wall behind him. Okay, so... Um, make your way confidently over to Narbo, uh, make your way over to the bar, sit down at the vacant table. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to go and walk over to the bar because I've done this um, before and uh, I've got some very favourable events from this. Now obviously later on we can uh, deviate a little bit more but I think we need to kind of try and minimise the damage at this point. It's very early in the game so walk over to the bar. Um, the bartender stifles a belch and nods in greetings. What could I do for you? The way he grabs an earthenware mug suggests that it would probably be best to order something. You glance at Yavik briefly before paying for two rounds of a local mushroom brew called Ash Tongue. It's somewhat less loathsome than you imagined. Leaning over your drink, you quietly tell the barman you're here to see Nabo. 
Are you now? He's doing calculations, and he don't like to be bothered when he's doing calculations. He indicates Narba at the corner table with a nod. The entrepreneur is indeed busy poring over a stack of papers and fiddling with a calculus. So we're going to wait, actually, um, and finish our beer. You chat with the bartender while sipping your beer. Most of it's boring small talk, but when the conversation turns into a discussion of local prices, you notice Yavik's stern expression and a small hand gesture that he makes. This is a signal that you two have been using for a long time now, um, indicating he's gleaned something from the man's surface thoughts. When minutes later the bartender goes into the back to check on the kitchen, Yavik leans closer. Apparently there's a supplier of meat and mushrooms that has a surplus on his hands he wants to get rid of quickly. You can't help but smile and nod. This could save you a lot of coin. Also, your friend Nabo seems to be having some trouble with a package. In his mind, it's a constant frustration in connection to the Heap King. You nod to Yavek and notice how the sleazy merchant stopped fiddling with calculus and now looking at his papers listlessly. It is time. Walk over to Nabo's table. The entrepreneur looks up from a stack of papers in front of him and rubs his eyes. There's, the icon here just shows you what he looks like. Uh, part of his face is covered in small scars similar to those left by old Burns. That coupled with a withered and mutated left arm that hangs limply at his side is a clear indication of the taint. The merchant wears a leather jerkin studded with small bronze and bone coins, a sign of wealth and boldness. His bodyguard, a lithe man with tribal tattoos and an outfit made of leather, moves his hand calmly to a spear that leans against the wall. Nabo's mouth falls open as a spark of recognition flares in his eyes. No wonder. It's been ten years. The fuck, mate? He blinks. I thought you'd croaked. People, um... Nabo waves his good hand round and looks at the bodyguard. Told tales of your demise. The man finishes his sentence for him as the merchant nods vehemently. That business with Kernak outpost in the storm, Nabo adds. You tell him that you were indeed at Kernak when the terrible arcane storm struck. You describe the horrors of that night briefly. You add how your original comet artist died there, close friends, old travelling companions. But you walked away unscathed. This was years ago. Sheesh, that fucker Irafons looked after you something fierce, eh? Nabo chuckles heartily. But I'm sure you haven't come to reminisce about good old times, eh? His predatory smile makes you cautious, even though he invites you to sit down with a casual wave of his meaty hand. So, we've got some options. Apologise to him... Get down to business or remind him you don't like threats. Now, okay, disclaimer, I've done this interaction before and we're going to go with number two just because it gives you a, a nice little bonus. You tell Nabo, let bygones be bygones and instead listen to what you have to offer. You got some balls coming here, all business and bold. After a tense moment, his stern expression turns into a toothless smile. I like it. The bodyguard visibly becomes less tense. Nabo opens his arms wide and bows his head. Let's hear it, mate. You breathe in. Time to outline your proposition. You explain to Nabo. Okay, there's a little info thing here. It just says, um, some choices have dependencies, meaning you can only pick certain choices if you have the right prerequisite. Some choices involve tests that can be failed or succeeded. Obviously, you want to succeed. Perks, characters, and resources can change the chance of success. Um, and it's basically a dice roll um, that you have to beat. You explain to Naibo how you want him to give you a discount on a shipment of metal scraps, which you would then smuggle into Devon through contacts you have in the city's underworld. The profit on the shipment would be quite exquisite. You do not name your contact, but divulge enough of her that the plan looks solid. Buyers, you say, are lining up, expecting the shipment soon. Nabo sits in silence, eyes fixed on the table, as if looking to some noise from afar. He does not cut you off at any time during your proposition. At length, after you are done, he looks up and gives you a weak smile. That sounds like you've been thinking about it a long time, he says. As is, he shifts in his chair. And it's a great plan, except for the part where I give you a discount for asking, and not much else. And I don't do that, mate. That would make me what, um, an almoner, the bodyguard adds discreetly. That a word? Nabo looks at him. When the old man nods, uh, and he turns back to you. I an almoner, see? I'm, I'm no almoner. You gotta do what you... You gotta do better than that. What you got for me? Now, we've got some options here, and these are quite important. So, we can tell him that you will be in his debt. We can buff this using resourcefulness, which is like a daily um, kind of 
stat that you replenish each day, um, but you only get so much of it. If we did this, we could probably get it to, well, it's still moderate, actually. That's not great. And then you can see that it is effect affected by how good we are. So we're actually very persuasive and relatively charismatic. Reminded that you two used to be a great team. We can only get that to low, so that's not really worth it. Um, reveal you're in a bad spot and this is your last chance. Or let him know that in exchange for his help, you can help him out with a problem he might have right now. Now, this little thing, Naba's secret value must exceed the requirement. Again, having done this before, we can either do the top one and probably succeed, or I'm going to actually use the bottom one because we've only found this out as we hung about at the bar um, and used Yavik to read his mind. So we're going to do the last one. Nabo's jaw drops when you insinuate that you know about his little problem. Fuck me, mate. You're better connected than I thought. Oh, you have something up your sleeve, the merchant says as he eyes Yavik suspiciously. For a while, he's quiet, then he looks up and narrows his eyes. Tell you what, I think we can help each other. You headed to Devon by way of Avern, am I? When you nod, Narbo leans closer and signals his bodyguard. The man with the dreadlock steps closer and carefully produces a small packet from beneath his leather jerkin, then puts it into the merchant's palm. This here little fella is mighty important to me, see? If you take this out of the sea and deliver it to my uh, associate in Avern, where are even? You get your discount scrap from me. The merchant offers you the package. Yavik draws in breath, but before he could speak, Narbo interrupts him. And before Pretty Boy asks, No, I won't tell you what I see in it, and don't even think about opening the package. What I can say is it ain't too dangerous to you yourself, but um, you might want to keep it hidden from the uh, good militia of uh, good old scrap heap. You take the package. The way Narbo glares at you makes it clear you have no other choice. This might be the opportunity you hoped for. So, at least we don't owe him, which is the other way that that could go. The package is small enough to fit in your palm, feels very light, and is wrapped in fine leather. You pocket it after briefly observing it. You'll be looking for a man named Skor now, and you've earned him. He ain't to be trifled with either. Just tell him I sent you, and you'll be fine. You can find him, or his men in Lavinus. Lavinus is watering the hole most of the time. Give this little fella to him, and to him only, understand? After you assure him you do, Nabo instructs you uh, to give him an hour, then look for his people at the market and simply introduce yourself. They will know what price they should give you on metal scraps by then. He motions to his man. You and Yavik stand up and make ready to leave. Reveur here will take you to the uh, back exit. We don't want to uh, give people the idea that you come here uh, to beg for almonds now, do we? Or anyone to connect us, um, or anyone to connect us and run to the militia for that matter. You got what you came for, so you leave Wraith Stash through the entrance and head back to the Comitatus. Okay, cool. And that's the end. Your journal, located in the bottom left, is now active. So we can click on this little book thing, um, and this gives us information. Your journal tells you you can view quests, tasks. To be honest, in the prologue, this thing is... I don't know. I, can't, I, I found it personally quite useless, but at least you can view things um, if you need them. Objectives are quests, um, unread entries are blue again, and gold is done. Tasks are narrative missions, and goals to complete for rewards. Um, for example, passengers um, that you can take. Uh, qualities can be statuses, gathered information, secrets. Okay, cool. We're just going to read these. So, deliver it to a man named Scorner. Buy everything for your journey. So, we need to have 24 metal scraps and 800 supplies, as well as the awnings equipment. Now, actually, we've got quite a lot of money. Um, I don't know why he's saying where that broke, because we're really not. Um, I've been in much worse positions. Um, we do have a wandering old man with us, who I presume is the narrator. And um, a merchant of Scrounger's Lane is selling his surplus cheap, so we might want to get down to Scrounger's Lane. The market pane is now active. Navigate to the market pane by clicking on the scales icon. The market pane shows available goods. Um, buy or sell them by clicking on them, uh, shift click, um, buys a whole stack, and then if you shift click on something, you can decide how much you want. We've actually got a lot of supplies right now, um, we've got 700, so we only need 100 more. Um, it's saying purchase 24 metal and additional supplies to have at least 800 units. Um, I'm going to go to Scrounder's Lane first though. You and Yavek roam the dingy market called Scrounder's Lane at the foot of the Great Heap upon which the Tower of the Heap King is built. 
Ash-covered awnings and dirty stalls line the labyrinth of streets which, uh, with stiflingly narrow alleys and tiny squares, adding to the general confusion. Sometimes it's difficult to shell, so, uh, see it to tell a shop from a dilapidated house, but for good reason. Most people who live here are also merchants to some extent, and even though the Heap King's militia is here to keep the peace, you can't help but notice all the shifting gazes. So we've got a little info about the Heap King. Um, he's called the Heap King. Most people have never seen him. Um, eventually he's charm and power earned in rulership. Rumoured to have been an important man in the Empire. Um, he commands personal influence. Interesting. Okay, um, so we're going to do a few things. We're going to um, find the merchant who's selling cheap supplies first. And it's, it, So when you hover over this, it's going to tell us... Uh, you see the bottom bit? Um, lower than the original... Uh, than the local price. So that, that is a very good thing. So we want to buy them. Uh, so we're going to buy that. Um, we're also going to go to this shop in an alleyway. Um, it seems like we have enough chance of success to find it. Um, we failed. Oh. My god, that's lame. That's actually really bad. Oh. No. Okay, well, yeah, basically, we could have got a Dwarven Compass and some other stuff from that shop, which is savage, because the Dwarven Compass is like one of the best things in the game. Oh, we should have used resourcefulness. Why didn't we do that? That was dumb. Okay, anyway. Okay, so we shouldn't stay in the market too long because we're going to get our purse cut. Okay, we're never going back to Scrounger's Lane, because otherwise we get robbed, yeah? Um, so, how many supplies do we have now? We've got 750, 775, so we do need to... Oh my god, they're so expensive. Unbelievable. Usually supplies are one or two, but this is five! Oh my god. Okay, well, it's a good job we got those cheap ones. Um, 750, 775, so we need to get this up to 50. Ugh, we're basically literally just getting robbed right now. Um, so that's 800. We want to buy all these scrap metal um, because that's our... Um... Oh my god, we're so broke. Equipment you can attach to a Comitatus is on the equipment panel. So we're going to buy these awnings as well. Um, these are really, really useful. They uh, basically reduce your consumption, which anything that does that is, is brilliant. Uh, the third type of cargo does not take up space. They're items. They can be used in certain events. Um, you can switch panes in a settlement, and you can now manage them. You can check the settlement times freely. Okay, cool. So we can actually um, have a look around. Kind of, there's some equipment here. We don't have anything else. Um, we can't really look around, and even though it told us we can. Um, there's not much we can actually gather from here. Okay, um, now, one other thing that we might uh, consider doing is buying some coal. Now, unfortunately, we don't have access to the pane here, um, which tells us the different types of prices. I personally can't remember if coal is um, cheap here. It probably is, but I'm not going to risk it. Uh, we're also quite broke now, so um, we may run out of money at some point. Um, okay, well, we can try and visit the Heap King, but... Okay, well, we can't get in there anyway, so there's no point. We might as well just leave. Um, nothing else we can do here. Okay, cool. Oh, so gutted about that Dwarven Compass. Unbelievable. Oh. oh, well, never mind. Okay, let's get out of here. Um, you spend the night in a guarded compound, so... This is actually a good um, decision, because uh, when you spend nights in towns, it uh, gives you a buff, usually, except in this hellhole, apparently. Um, okay, move along towards the inspection. Um, they're looking for the package, apparently, but it's well hidden at the bottom of a sack of dried mushrooms, because we're not idiots. So we get out of here. 
unscathed. The commentators is well on its way and Scrap Heap is a mere dot on the horizon by the time Yevik joins you at the front of the line. Just like I said, you made the right choice with this venture. Talk of how you may have saved us all is spreading like wildfire, he says with a smile. Of course, we'd have to make it to Devon with the cargo, but it's a good start, don't you think? Let's just nod in agreement. We don't want to big him up too much, um, do we? Okay, so, um, with that, you both go back to your duties. If all goes well, you should reach the wound. So we've got a new thing we're going to read. Uh, the wound is a chasm of a, a 15 miles long cleft that runs between the broken hills next to the dead forest. It's a huge ravine that glows with a crimson light and is covered with a blood-like liquid. Wow, how disgusting. The penetrating, horrid smell of the gangrenous wound covers the whole area. No one has ever returned from the ventures to the bottom of the pit. Abominable creatures born of the blood-like liquid wander the wound's vicinity, sometimes attacking indiscriminately, other times not paying mind to passers by. Okay, lovely. Well, that sounds uh, safe. Okay, the journey continues. We got lots of morale, which is great. I think our morale's very high now. Okay, it says here, your progress is saved at checkpoints. Um, when you leave a settlement, reach a story-related checkpoint, as well as the, at the start of each in-game day, your game is saved automatically, overwriting the previous autosave save. Wow, I think that's savage, because we... Okay. I'm just, I'm worried about my game that I've been playing for like a million years. Um, so this... This is us. We don't have any main campaign saves. Hopefully it won't override previous auto saves too much. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, what about... Oh, God, I didn't think about that. Okay. Uh, never mind. Uh, so, yeah, basically we can't save, which is quite traumatic, but um, it saves automatically each day. Uh, manual saving is unavailable, um, but normally you can save by pressing F F10. You can load games from the menu. There they were with a full cargo hold and filled with newfound hope. Yet, the road ahead still promised hardships and peril. I travelled with them southwards, expecting to reach more habitable lands beyond the Molten Tongues River of Lava. Okay, we're just going to keep plodding along. So we can only go in one direction, which usually... Um, usually you can go in more than one direction, but we're going to go this way. Crew management UI is active. Click on the sheet to open it. Okay, again, massive info dump here. So a lot of information. This we don't need, really, um, this bottom part, so we're going to ignore that. Um, but it goes through um, some stuff for us. So morale is the mood. Um, obviously, you don't want to have low. Obedience is how happy the slaves are. Nutrition is how well fed your people are. Vigor is how tired the comitatus is. This is very important, this one. Um, you want to keep it high. Upkeep is how much you owe your crew. You can pay them daily or uh, save off payment. I always try and pay them every day um, just because it keeps them happy. Uh, consumption is how much food you're consuming, so that's relatively low. I've seen higher, but I've also seen lower. Passengers are people that your comitatus takes on um, for events. Which is somewhere. don't know. I can't. I don't, they're being blocked it off for some reason. Passengers. I'm not sure. You can see that. Um, okay. Oh, here, down here. It's passengers. A wandering old man. Tells you his consumption. Wow, he eats a lot. Um, here you can see a number of each crew and beast type you have in your commentators. Um, consult the tooltip for each type. Outriders are good because they... Um, because you need a fighter and a mount. Outriders are excellent fighters. Mounts without riders carry cargo. You can always dismount fighters using the minus button. So we're going to add an outrider. Seems like our cargo is still fine. What happens if we add two? 
Mm, I don't know, it seems fine. Do they eat more or something? Oh, interesting. They take more food, so probably we only want to add one. Um, but now add an outrider, then close this window. Okay, so we're going to keep going. You run out of movement points and need to camp. Being on the road all day lowers vigor, um, which can be replenished by camping. Set the camp icon. Another uh, info screen here. Um, I'll try and summarize it the best you can. This actually is probably one of the most important screens in the game. We're going to be using this a lot. Um, at the end of each day, your competitor makes camp. Supplies are consumed and movement points are refreshed. In each camp, you can decide to offer normal or double wages. Now, double payment improves morale, but I don't know. We, we're quite tight on money right now, so we're probably not going to do that. Um, you should always pay now, though, um, in my opinion. Um, yeah, the longer you leave it off, obviously they get grumpy. Obedience and nutrition appear here again. Um, you want to keep those high. Rations, you can change the amount of rations you have. So if you're running out, running low, go 50%. Or you can give them a lot more if you have extra to um, increase uh, nutrition. And uh, I think it actually helps with something else when the rations are really high. All the lock icons um, allow you to save the current settings. Oh, that's actually great. So we're going to pay now. Uh, it wants to give us more info. No. Okay. Bottom left. Hunting and foraging. Um, you can send your crew out into the wasteland. This is actually really, really useful. And I try and do this as much as possible. A hunting uses scouts and has a very high chance to get, get supplies. Uh, but if you fail, you can scouts can die. Foraging is reliable, but yields fewer supplies. You can also find other stuff as well, um, actually. A uh, summary of what happened to your crew that day can be seen on the right. Um, you can also talk to your companions and heal them. But you can click this though to use medical supplies. Now this is, in my, from my experience of the game, very useful. So I nearly always use it if companions are injured. Um, okay, we're going to go through. So we're going to change this first of all. We're going to post guards. Um, because that will increase our, you see here, it's going to increase obedience and morale. But not vigor, which is fine. We're going to pay now and lock it. We're going to keep rations at 100% and lock that as well for now. Uh, we've got two movement points. So this is an important thing that actually I, I gleaned from watching a YouTube video. Um, usually doing these things cost one vigor, which is bad. But if you have two movement points left, it costs two movement points. So you want to always keep two movement points left unless you're very desperately traveling somewhere so that you can do these actions for free so keep keep these free um we've got a lot of slaves why are there so many slaves my gosh okay um what we'll do as well is we're going to talk to yavek and um morwin while we're here so you approach yavek he's tending to one of your beasts of burden when he sees you uh wish to talk he steps away and then we're going to go through these options and have a look. So what do you think about Nabba's package? We know all this anyway, really. But um, basically, he wants to get out of Scrap Heap. I don't plan on opening it. Um, that would also antagonize this Scornar fellow who appeared a tough customer. So we have gleaned something from Yavek again. Um, was there something else you wanted to ask him? What do you think about Avernum? Um, hasn't been there for a long time. It's not as large as Devon or Torzag's shelter. Another info thing there. But it's a busy city with a lot of people in commerce. Um, they say the prefect who oversees the place has his own private things going on, and he's fairly easy on the crime bosses. Okay. Uh, trade from the region concentrates on Avernum, so it's a good good place to be. Ask him about his past. Um, not much to say. I spent most of my youth on the road. He's good at beast stuff. Um, my abilities were a great help. Why is this telling us to do this? Who knows? I sought my training to enhance my telepathic skill, and then I uh, returned to life. Ask him where he got his telepathic training. He frowns. That's something I don't wish to divulge, but I swore an oath. Okay, fair. Um, about his past. Ask him where he was born. I can't say where I was born. Uh, my mother was on the move. The way he says mother seems hurtful. Okay. 
That wasn't very long. She sold me. I was a slave. Oh my god, he was a slave. Your silence prompts a faint smile as he adds. I never said it because you never asked, but it's no secret really. I was liberated at quite a young age by Vargas who saw potentially me and my abilities. Cool. Ask him about his strange abilities. I am what you say, uh, call it afflicted. That is, someone with abilities beyond those of mortals. These abilities vary from person to person. Mine are what you might call telepathic. Mental powers that can sense, enhance, and even manipulate the thoughts of both beasts and men. These afflictions are thought to have originated from the calamity. I couldn't say myself. I only know that I've had them since I can remember. It started manifesting uh, as inexplicable sensations and a sixth sense, but with hard work I was able to turn it into a controlled skill set. Okay, cool. Enough chatting. Uh, let's talk to Morwen. Morwen uh, is our scout person. Um, she sees you step away and she comes to speak to you. Um, you immediately start to feel, feel anxious, as if roused out of t torpor by Tarkin coffee. The effects of a Demon King heritage, no doubt. Anything I can do for you? Um, ask what she thinks about the Comitatus. Basically, Morwen doesn't really care. She's pretty chill. Um, she's basically the opposite of Yavik because he's he's very tense. Ask what she thinks about Yavik. She doesn't trust him, uh, but he's always been kind to everyone, so she's glad he's travelling with us. Pretty chill. Ask about her past. I was a mercenary. You don't need to know. Ask her about Demon King. This is interesting. She seems thoughtful for a moment. Now, I can't speak for all of us because there's so many kinds and variants. We're called Demon Kin since it's our See, since it's said that demonic blood runs through our veins. Around us, people feel uneasy or anxious. Each of us has abilities that men of the Empire do not possess. I can see in the dark. Cold gets to me slower, and my skin gets burned less likely than that of humans. It's all very practical. Oh, and I have these. She points to her horns. So we're going to click on the demon kin. Um, there's quite a bit of info here, but basically demon kin is a name for people who've had their... Uh, who are slightly changed. Um... For those who are less than half demon or demonic ancestry. Demonic blood typically manifests as an aura of uneasiness that surrounds demon kin. Um, each demon kin produces a set of traits. Thus, a Morgai demon would have fangs, heat vision, the ability to fly or turn to smoke, enhanced strength or agility, or any number of these, just like a Morgai demon itself. Interesting. Demons uh, typically mingle with mankind. Uh, while some other races, such as Dwarves or Elves, do not have demon kin. Okay, interesting. Ogres have been known to mix with demon kind, similarly to humans. Uh, demon kin came to be fairly common on the continent after the Calamity. So yeah, the barriers have been broken between the Outer Realms and Zerin, allowing denizens of the Plains to enter and thrive in the Riven Realms. Most people can't really tell them apart from the other strange creatures. Um, they do not have unique culture, um, living among other races typically. Um, the Empire has been known to make use of their abilities, and the demonic cult of bal ur -Kal, especially the Nosferatis Sisterhood, has drawn many into their fold. Still, most of them are independent, and they have no real agenda. Okay, cool. Um, yep, and we're done. So, we will go through... The reason why we talk to them uh, as well is because every one of those blue codex entries gives us a codex updated um, thing. Which uh, is good for us. Oh, I just realised you can't see that far down. That's so odd. wonder why. Hmm, okay, well, you shouldn't... Nothing should really get cut off down there. It's probably more important that you can see the top, I suppose. Yeah. That is odd. Oh, well. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to end the day um, here. So... Here, it tells us how our hunting and foraging went. So we failed foraging, but we still got four. Nobody got harmed, so that's fine. But we had a success in scouting, so we got another 37 supplies, which is great. Okay, we're going to plod along. Uh, so we're going to go... Um, this time, we're going to go all the way to nine. Um, maybe we'll... I just want to keep these things high. Um, we're going to be okay for... We might get tough on supplies. Let's go here and camp. It seems like a bit of a waste, but I think it's probably going to be worthwhile. Yeah, we're still getting food because there'll be a point where we can't actually get any more food um, from the area we were in because we're too close to the lava flows. 
So let's go with this. Um, we're doing okay for money as well. Um, we did well. Again, foraged. We got some more supplies. We actually got, went up a day in supplies, which is great. After a long day's march under bleak skies and harassed by hot winds, your comitatus finally settles down in a wide ravine. After taking care of chores and checking on your comets, you go to your tent and tuck in for the night. There are benefits to sleeping out in the wasteland. The t silence is calming, tranquil even, only the murmur of a distant fire belching mountain. The whisper of the wind and the occasional groans of your beasts can be heard, except something else is making a muffled noise you do not recognize. Your eyes flick open. Something is wrong. What in Tartarus is it now? You rise to check it out. Leaving your tent, passing the sleeping beasts, you're just about to call a guard when you stumble upon a large quadru quad quadrupedal creature covered with fused bone and protrusions. It's munching on supplies scattered around the ground, evidently from a torn open sack lying nearby. The creature is a Jakra, a wasteland scavenger that hunts in packs. We're going to just have a look at this. Jackras are the vermin of the wasteland, bad-tempered and aggressive pack hunters. They've plagued the Riven Realm since the Calamity. They're four-legged reptiles covered by hardened yellow-brown grown scales. They can be three to four feet high, thick, powerful, short legs, and that can propel themselves forward quite fast. But they can't maneuver very well. They have thick scale plates, very stubborn creatures, uh, they hunt in packs, um, they, you know, hunt you down till you're dead. They're omnivorous, but have a taste for flesh. Okay, cool. Um, out of the shadows, Morwen leaps at it, tackling it aside and cutting its hide with her bone axe. You breathe out, realizing she's probably just saved your life. Yavik runs up to you as the creature uh, backs off and lets out a long howl. There are more of these accursed things, boss. Must have sneaked past the perimeter guards. They're trying to chase them off. He blurts. As he does, you can hear yelling and sounds of battle. The wounded jacker is joined by another one. Okay, so we're going to get into a combat now. So, okay, bear with me. The combat looks a bit janky. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. But the mechanics are simple. Um, and it actually works quite well and it's fairly enjoyable. I don't find it as kind of punishing as some other kinds of combat where you have um, characters like this um, in a kind of third person uh, situation. Um, I find it's not too hard to do relatively well. I'll probably get mashed now. Um, and you can often deal with the consequences afterwards. Um, anyway, I'm not going to read through a lot of this stuff. So basically, combat is turn-based. You can deploy companions. It happens in rounds. You fight the enemy. I don't want to... What? Ugh. Okay. The order in which they go is um, done by initiative. Now, ordinarily, you would want Morwen here... Because otherwise Yavik can get hit. Yavik's a powerful kind of spell guy, but you don't want him in the front lines. Although he does have some melee abilities. Sorry, all the reading is getting to me a bit. Okay. Um, all components add 1 to 6 to their innie to determine the order. So we're going to get attacked now, I think. Oh, you would go for Yavik, wouldn't you, Grim? Melee skills can only be used from the front row. Um, they can only target enemies that are adjacent or back row enemies if they're no front row. Because of these rules, melee placement is paramount. All characters can move to an adjacent position. If they move to another character, that character is pushed out of the position. Hmm. Yep, yeah, makes them more difficult to hit with, with range skills. When you want to move, select the move. And move here so waste of a turn really but never mind each companion has four combat skills besides move you can search skills or move by clicking on them use mind blast to attack one of your opponents so we're gonna go with this one so cool okay round two so we got Mormon uh, Mormon skills include the option to push front row enemies back and to pull back row enemies to the front some skills are more complex um, including a move, move and a, an attack, strafe. These type of skills can be used to great effect. So this is actually a really great advice. So we're going to kick this um, guy back. So what that will do is it will stop it from being able to attack this turn. Um, because if it's not on the front row and it's a melee character, it can't attack anyone. You can consult the combat log, blah, blah, blah. So 
So what we're actually going to do now is we're going to um, let's have a look. It's got it's got four. You can click on this here to examine what skills they have. So mind blast is three to four now. Probably it was a good idea to actually try and kill this creature. So that's what we're going to do. Hopefully it didn't. No, it didn't. That's kind of annoying to be honest, um, but never mind. They're going to waste their turn moving though, so that's okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to use Strafe, which can attack both. And then we'll move down. Okay, that's good. However, we've left Yavik open, which was a bit dumb. Um, so... Uh, never mind. Yeah, that was kind of dumb, but never mind. Um, what we'll do is we'll use Premonition, which is going to give us a buff. Um, it buffs us and someone else, so hopefully that will help him uh, when he gets attacked. Which he probably oh, he did get attacked, that's fine. Okay, we're just going to go for pure damage now because um, we want to get this fight over with, uh, before it gets its turn. That was unlucky. Okay, at least she blocked it though, that was good. And then we're just going to finish it off. Brilliant. It's not dead. What the heck? Okay, that was cool. He got crit with his mind blast. Okay, we won and uh, we only got a couple of small injuries, which is okay. The two Jackra lie dead. Bear in mind, that was a very, very easy combat. Like, two soul creatures. I fought five, so it can get bad. The two Jackra lie dead at your feet. Mormon wipes the foul-smelling blood from her axe blade as a guard talks to her. You okay, boss? Yavik pats you on the shoulder. You nod, turning to Mormon as she approaches you. All hostiles taken care of, she says. They got to some of the food, but we could take their meat and other parts to make up for it. So... What we're going to do is we are going to harvest them um, because we've got the perk hunting. So we'll get some supplies. We got some cool kit too, uh, which is a good, good idea. Um, then we're going to go to... So at this point, if I remember correctly, even if we go here, we actually can't hunt because we're too close to the lava flow. So we're going to go for the full nine this time. The chart is now active. This is basically a map. Um, it's going to tell us a load of stuff about it. The map's really cool. I love this map. It's a very kind of... I suppose it's a bit Tolkien-esque. Um, but yeah, you can kind of scroll around. But you can also interact with it as well. So you can see like the wound here. Point of interest. Avernum's all the way down there. That's actually really, really far away. Um, we're going to have a tough time. But never mind. Mark of Urnum. Nine days. We don't have enough uh, supplies for nine days. We only have seven. Things are start, going to start to get tough then. Okay. We don't really want to use Vigor. We can actually hunt, so we messed up. Maybe we do want to use Vigor to hunt. Supplies are going to be the most important thing, to be honest. We also might want to actually go down to rations a bit um that gives us more combat strength though hmm. i think that's what we'll do we're gonna actually ration a bit now and we're gonna we're gonna heal our characters yeah okay i'm probably gonna regret doing this ration thing later on but never mind Hunting failed to nine. Okay. Force March allows you to move further than your maximum movement points on each given day. Um, Force March gets you further. The crew lose vigor and even morale. It's strongly recommended you refrain from marches until you have more experience. Cool. Okay, we're going to camp, but I don't... Oh, there is actually supplies. For some reason, I thought that there were... Um, there was an, a point where we couldn't get... I don't know why I thought that. Never mind. Um, okay, I think I'm all fine with just doing it like this. Apologies if I go quickly through this screen, but um, we, we're going to see a lot of this screen, so it probably is best to um, not spend too long on it. Okay, we, we're not doing very well with hunting. We actually lost one vigor, which is grim. 
Um, but okay. We'll go this far and see see how we get on. I feel like there's an event going to happen soon. I think we're actually going to keep going at this point. Um, we might even want to force march, but I think we'll hold off on the force march situation for now. Okay, there's an event. As the Comitatus is scaling another stretch of black sand dunes, one of the outriders uh, you sent out to screen your left flank rides in on the line and heads immediately to you. You can see the man is in a panic right away from the way he hops off the saddle while accelerating and almost falls over. Decelerating. Before he reaches you, your guardsmen are already setting up a de defensive perimeter. You beckon to the beast drivers to halt the line. Progress! They are coming! I saw them walking over the dunes! The pilgrims are coming! A murmur of terror washes over the Comitatus. Clearly your scout was referring to the last pilgrimage. <sighs> Excuse me. Oh, well, this reading makes you yawn. This group of spectral horrors is known to appear out of nowhere and eradicate even large groups of travellers in a matter of minutes. Nobody quite knows what happens to those who encounter them uh, up close, as nobody has lived to tell the tale. Some reckon people were reputedly able to take a peek at the otherworldly wayfarers, but during your many years of Argus, you've never met anyone whose story was credible. You know all too well that if your outrider tells the truth, uh, you know all too well that your outrider tells the truth, and you see no reason why you wouldn't. The only chance of survival is for you to run and hide. Now, I think we're gonna hide. Outriders report uh, there is a rocky area not too far away. Um, Comitatus finds a stretch of bad lands crisscrossed by shallow ravines. The jagged, tall rock formations here are covered in fine black sand of Arenas Negras. Already, the scouts are busy setting up hiding places among the rocks and gullies. You're all behind cover in a matter of minutes. Everyone settles down. They either pray to whatever god they believe in or prepare for a desperate last stand. But what about you? Perhaps there's a chance now uh, to take a look at the last pilgrimage from up close. No, surely it would be insane to attempt such a thing, wouldn't it? As you're pondering this, the wind picks up from the northeast, carrying with it clouds of black dust, the perfect cover for spying. There is still time before the storm hits with the full brunt of his force. Oh god, I have only ever done this one. I am quite tempted now to um, try and do the second one and have a look. But I feel like that would be really, really dumb. I don't know. I'm kind of torn. If anyone is in chat wants, uh, has a particular persuasion, let me know. Um, I'm still tempted to go with the top one. I f I'm quite worried that if we have a look at them, something really bad will happen. Probably best we go with the um, top one, though. Yeah, let's go at the top one. Hunker down, we'll end pray. Um, soon, the dust storm reaches Zenith, but you spot a faint glowing apparition uh, from behind the cover as it slithers between the dunes. Uh, from this distance, it could be anything in that eerie glimmer. Yet, you and your crew are grateful for that space between you and the spectres. At length, the pilgrimage passes and takes the dust storm with it. Some people talk of strange images, like waking dreams, while, otherworldly, while the otherworldly shimmer was visible. However, you saw nothing, and can't help but wonder if it isn't their imagination and fear playing tricks on them. The Comitatus digs itself out of the black dirt and uh, black sand and dirt ponderously. You're ready in half an hour. Most of your commas are hushed and keep a wary eye. Okay, so we lost a morale and movement, which is bad. But luckily we had zero movement, so we didn't really lose any movement. But morale's not looking good. Okay. Yeah, we can't. We're not going to get any stuff now, so we might as well just end the day. Um, we're doing actually okay on supplies, um, because of our hunting's been quite good. So we're going to end the day there. Still, we are six to nine days away. So we've only got six days. So I'm feeling like we want to be going pretty quickly now. Um, otherwise, we're going to run out of food. I also feel like probably hunting is going to be bad in this area. So let's go quick. 
Should we even force march? Hmm. Maybe that would be bad for us, though. Probably what's going to happen is we'll lose some vigor. Um, we probably... I don't think we're quite that desperate yet, so let's just camp. Again, there's no food, so there's no point sending out any scouts or anything. Um, we could... We don't really want to go down to Hungary. Yeah, we're getting in a bad way, though. And I can't seem to heal these guys. Not doing very well. Ooh, an event. The Comitatus climbs the Blast Black Dune and comes to a halt on your mark. Standing on one of the carts, you spy the horizon carefully before hopping down and convening with your most trusted. Ahead looms the Voiceless Lake, a place of qu deathly quiet and utter peril. The lava flow of this particular tendril of the Molten Tongue cools down uh, here, uh, below a tough shell of dark rock covered by steaming water. Yet the shell is not sold enough in places. It can crack in the blink of an eye and un open under one's foot, leading to a sudden scalding death. There are ways to guess where it's safe to cross, but it has to be done slowly um, and attentively. Your scouts know the way around here, but because the lava changes constantly beneath the shell, they have to rely on finding a new way through each time. The lake is voiceless because everyone has to keep quiet. That way, one might hear the shifting lava and cracking shell just in time to avoid disaster. Your lieutenants agree crossing over to the far side is better than going around. However, uh, after coming, um, especially after coming so close to the last pilgrimage a few days ago. So what's what's the Arenas Negras? It's a desert of black sand. Um, people usually disappear. <sighs> yeah, it doesn't sound good. Nothing lives here. Used to be Calderum, capital of the San Vorati province. Um, the city of light was made into its most horrible caricature. It's filled by eerie moaning and death. Right, okay. So, um, we definitely want to make sure that we beat this, so we're going to use some resourcefulness, uh, which is not even tracking at the moment, so I don't know what the situation is with that. Okay, we succeeded. Um, yeah. Yeah. We did well. So I've actually never had that event go that well. Um, so that's really good. And we got one morale, which is great. Um, what we'll do is... It's saying five days left of food. Avernum's four to five days away. I think we're doing okay. Now, I highly doubt we can hunt around here. So I'm just going to move us on one more. And then camp. Oh, we could march a little bit. Hmm... I'm not liking this march, though. Let's just camp. There is no food around here anyway, so... Try and heal them up again. End day. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, let's go as far as here and see what happens. Oh, Just as we were about to leave that damnable lake behind, we heard it. An abominable shriek pierced the air and made us gasp. It came from behind some hills nearby, coupled with the ruckus of battle. The armed women and men of the Comitatus looked at their Vagras questioningly. Okay. Big event now. Scouts come running toward the cart line as you're about to enter the badlands south of the lake and hear what could only be described as a paralyzing howl accompanied by an unmistakable sound of battle. There's a battle going on, Vagras, just beyond yonder hills, the scout points out southeast. Some armed folk are being attacked by bloody undead. A murmur washes over the crew, and many of them readied their weapons. Not to give aid to fellow travellers and dire need is believed to attract dire peril on yourselves. Besides, it would be better to fight the undead together than alone if it comes to that. The tension is rising with each passing moment, with everyone watching you. Now, I've done this before a couple of times. Um, any delay, this doesn't work. This is also bad because we get attacked anyway. I think this is a waste of time. I think we're going to rush in, actually, and see see where that gets us. Yeah, we get extra morale if we rush in, so that's good. Um, that's great for us. You clamber over the next uh, over the hills um, and see a brutal melee. Um, bodies are strewn over. Most of them are undead, but a few are mangled, burnt humans. 
Another such man, a rogue priest with a shaven head, falls to the ground after flying half a dozen yards, following a bone-crunching hit from a looming white giant. The creature looks to be made up of several bodies fused by some combination of natural disaster and twisted magic. The rest of the shamblers look like they're smouldering. The great white abomination engages the last two men, a white-faced, lightly armoured enforcer with a shield, and a tall man in elaborate black armour wielding a greatsword. Both of them look worse for wear. Okay, cool. Going to have another combat. Um, luckily, both our guys got healed up. Um, we can deploy companions, so we want to deploy like this. Actually, probably like this. Because that guy's probably going to die soon, because he's on low health. He's only on one. Um, some of already deployed. Always useful in the front row. Yavik's ability is over the back row. Okay, it's just telling us about deployment, so we don't really need to uh, be paying attention to that. Um, this thing is damaged, though. We probably want to kill those quite quickly. Be useful for us. Oh, it's damaged. Hmm, interesting. He's also low health. Oh, this isn't good. Okay, well, we're going to go with this. Oh, God, the conflict. Oh, my God! What in seven hells? Some skills can target friendly uh, units to support or even heal them. In this fight, a lot of Yavik skills cannot be used because undead enemies are immune to mind-affecting effects. Yavik is far from useless. He can use his premonition skill to keep his allies buffed. So we don't... I personally know that Sidarius is very good at block. Um, so we're actually going to buff Morwen. For now. He looks nice, yeah, absolutely hideous creature. Look at it. It's weird, melting faces. Um, combat's cruel, and in general, you cannot heal during it. Your defenses are the main way to mitigate. Evade allows you to completely avoid, but you'll be moved. A block provides extra armor, mitigating more damage, but you can still suffer damage when blocking, and also suffer adverse effects. Each companion has different evade or block skills, so basically you can change whether they evade or block. Morwen's actually good at evade, Sidaris is good at block. Uh, Yavik's good at evade. So we'll keep her on evade. Because um, her block is 15%, evade is 25%. So it's much more likely that she will evade. Um, what we're going to do is... We might... Maybe we just want to try and kill this creature. How much damage can we do there? Two to five. So it's quite unlikely she's actually going to kill it. Um, we might want to... Hmm, depends which one this is. It's that one. So we probably want to kick it back. Or what we could do is we could try and pull this creature forward so that Sidarius can hit both. I'm not sure that's really worthwhile, though. My thoughts are kick. Let's go defensive for now. I know it waits to turn moving. What? It can move and attack? Ridiculous. What? It's OP as hell. No way. Oh my god. Yeah, rush down. Ah, oh, that, well, that was dumb. There's no point in us actually kicking it. Okay, great. So now this is very tough. Blah, blah, blah. He also has a support skill that enhances his stats and a debilitating uh, bane. Cleave affects um, affects two targets. Okay. Um, right. So, probably we just want to hit... Actually, we kind of want to kill that. So let's try and kill this thing. Nice work, Sidarius. Cinnabon's going to rush down him again. That was a lot of damage. You, the Vargas, may not take part in combat directly, but you can influence it. You have two options. Aid, which revives a down companion, or um, Inspire, which gives a substantial defense buff to a character for a few rounds. Um, we're probably going to buff Sidarius, is what we're going to do. Because he's going to be doing most of the fighting. Um, I don't think we can mind blast anything, so probably what we'll do is 
Premonition Sidarius again. Yep, so we'll give him some serious buffs. And uh, Morwin is gonna attack. I'm not sure she can attack both of these, to be honest. But we can try. No, she couldn't attack both, so that was a bit dumb, really, but never mind. Um, she got attacked. Now it's Sidarius' turn. I think what we want to actually do with Sidarius is some damage minimalization. So we're going to do use Bane on the horrific creature because it's so powerful. If it hits us, we're going to be in serious trouble. Um, however, it might be worthwhile to kill this creature as well. What's its accuracy? Um, 80%. Oh my god, Fatal Embrace. That's bad. Yeah, we want to use Bane on this creature. So, less likely to hit us. Yeah, so it missed. So that, that was directly what we did. So that was a good choice. Um, we're going to use this to try and kill it, which is brilliant. Then we're going to use... Hmm, I wonder if Mind Blast can actually affect this creature. Um, it's got 50% to poison anyway. Um... Okay. Hmm. Not sure about this, to be honest. What we should do. She's... They're both still buffed, so... Let's try... Let's have a go at, at trying to mind bend it and see what happens. It did nothing, so... Obviously, it's pointless um, doing that. Um, he's in serious trouble, but he's already baned this, so... There's not much else we can really do to it. We can either try and buff ourselves, or... I think we're just going to attack. Oh, he's probably going to mash us now. God, so powerful. Also, that is bad, because Yavik's now in the front row. Okay, he actually has this thing um, where he can stab things, but then move. So I'm going to do that and swap him back, which is actually really useful. Um, we will just attack with her. We're just going to keep attacking it. Oh, wow, that was good. Okay, he's still got a lot of health. Ah, oh, that was lucky. Okay, she needs buffing up again. Although, she is far away. Yeah, okay, let's buff her up. Unfortunately, she's trapped at the back now, so we're going to have to move her up and waste a turn. So this is going to attack again. Okay. Okay. Um, need to rebuff Sidarius. And attack the creature. Attack the creature again. Actually, maybe we want to. Um, yeah, we want to use Bane again. To try and stop it from hitting us. I think Bane's run out. Oh, God, it's still got us. Oh, Jesus. We really just have nothing to do with him right now, to be honest. Um, we can't move the creature, I don't think. Um, so we might just... I don't know, we'll just skip his turn. There's nothing else we can really do. We could try and trade him out for Sidarius, because Sidarius could die, and that would be bad, but... I don't know. I don't know. Let's try and mind it, see what happens. It does nothing. I really don't want Sidarius to get down, though. There's not much we can really do. He's got no power left as well. Okay, he's probably going to get killed right now. Okay, he's still alive, just... Oh god, this is taking way too long. Just going to get him now, surely. Attacked her? Unbelievable. What a joke. This is taking so long. Okay, we're going to use our last premonition. Do it. Yes! Okay, we, that was still pretty crippling. Um, but we did quite well. Nobody died, so that's good. Um, it's over. The undead finally stopped moving. Their bodies lie mutilated all around the hills. 
The large abomination was hacked to pieces and is now a jumbled pile of ash and petrified bones. Some of your crew got torn up. There are several wounded and one dead. The man in black armor is the only one of his company who survived. He's sitting on a rock nearby, covered in ash from hacking at the abomination, drinking ponderously from a water skin while he's observing the battlefield. His grim gaze wanders from one slain companion to another, as if wanting to make sure that all of them are dead. At length, his piercing gaze finds you, and a chill runs down your spine. There's no doubt in your mind that the man and you need to talk. You walk over. So we lost a fighter, um, which is bad for us, but could have been worse. You walk up to the man and offer him your hand. He looks at you um, in a gesture of mild contempt. His great sword, forge of steel, steel, lies across his lap. He does not take your hand. You seem to be the leader of this, Comitatus. What is your business here? We need a cool voice for Sedaris, actually. <clears throat> Don't know what to do, though. We could go like, You seem to be the leader of this, Comitatus. What is your business here? The bluntness of his question, coupled with the man's evident hostility and ungratefulness, leave you speechless. Perhaps it's for the best. You notice the man is bearing the symbol of Sergorod, which should make you cautious. Now, Sergorod is one of the gods. The new gods. Sergorod is the god of vengeance, anger, malevolence, and curses. A member of the Triumvirate, he's one of the three gods of the Empire's official religion. He's regarded as the war god of the new pantheon, but in truth he's much more than that. His church is tasked with upholding law, hunting down criminals, and delivering justice. This gives the Sergorodites unprecedented power that's often abused. Most people who serve, uh, who serve in wars, um, who come in contact with justice, call upon the god of vengeance, and of course, everyone who has a grudge too. According to legend, Sergorod found the Twelve, that's the people who rule the Empire, just after the Calamity, and offered them his help in taking vengeance on whoever caused the downfall of Imperial society. They accepted it, even though the Elder Gods, who caused the Cataclysm, had disappeared from this reality. It's the Raging One, whose church fuels the war effort against the Green Continent in the North, and the constant investigations into potential internal threats. Also called the Master of Curses, Sergrod provides magical abilities to his most devoted followers, who can afflict others with debilitating curses and draw might from their own wrath. It's also known that priests of Sergrod can detect lies, which is one of the chief reasons his inquisitors are dreaded so much. Sergrod is often depicted as a huge, bald, raging man with colossal muscles carrying a brutal mace or sometimes a two-handed axe. He almost always wears armour, often casting real iron upon the statues riddled with barbs, blades and spikes, which are also carried over the decorations of his temple buildings. His priests shave their heads and paint it white, with a black line running vertically across each eye, representing the all-seeing eye of the Raging One. Sergorod is closely tied to two of the Fulcimus Imperium, the Knights of the Black Sun and the Atamanis. His influence on the Knightly Order is especially strong. Some say it's become his own il military elite instead of the original shared religious order between him and Axul. Okay, cool. Yeah, the gods, there's a lot of lore about the gods and information, so... Um, you know, every time that comes up, there's going to be a bit of an info kind of dump. So, uh, tell him that you are a trading commentators traveling south. Tell him you're only a traveling company. Tell him it's none of his business. We're going to go with, um, trading commentators. I see. So you turning up here is a matter of utter coincidence, I take. When you assure him it is, he narrows his eyes and pierces you with his gaze. There's a tense moment that seems to take forever. You are truthful, Vagrus. Commendable. The man rises from the rock. He towers over you now, and it dawns on you that the war gear he carries uh, makes him either a very rich or a very powerful person in this metal-starved world, or both. I'm grateful for your assistance in this skirmish, late as it was, he says, turning to look at Yavik, who appears at your side and bows his head to the man. Without acknowledging your friend or his greeting, the armoured fellow turns to you again. My name is Sidarius. I'm a knight of the Order Snegros Solis. By aiding me, Vagras, you have aided Imperial law. You must have some questions of your own. Now is your chance to ask them. Okay. The Ordis Negrosolis, Order of the Black Sun, is the first and foremost, foremost knightly order of the Empire, one of the religious orders called the uh, Pillars of the Empire. Fulcimus Imperium. They worship Sergord and Axel, being proficient in both the god of vengeance's military powers and the king of death's necromancy. 
The knights are picked from the best soldiers, nobles and warriors. After they undergo rigorous training, they serve by guarding aristocrats, aiding military exploits and hunting down enemies at the Empire. They have an official status as inquisitors, investigators and executioners. Um, the knights are very rich. They often have black metal armour. Sedaris so stands before you, awaiting your questions. Ask him about his companions. The companions lie dead. There is nothing else you need to know, save only that they were all dedicated servants of the Empire who did not flinch in the uh, face of ultimate adversity. They were all members of the Church of Sugarond. More reading. The Church of Sugarond is a religious institution in of the God of Vengeance. It's tasked with upholding the law, hunting down criminals, and delivering justice. This gives Sugarondites and prison of power that's often abused. Um, in theory, to aid the Empire, one of the most important tasks of the Church. Um, blah blah blah. The high priests of the Church wield great political and magical power, often holding seats at the Senate. The head of the Church is the Grand Inquisitor, chosen from among the most prominent priests by a council. All priests start as acolytes and go through religious, magical, and combat training. Their magic includes powerful, debilitating curses, granting enhanced strength and durability that stems from rage, the detection of lies, and hidden magical effects. The church has close ties to the Order of the Black Sun. Um, they work together. The Order of Ex Executors is a military sect. The High uh, Executor uh, often wields power equal to or surpassing the Grand Inquisitor. Interesting. Uh, the church has a lot of temples. Uh, the major cathedrals are found in Torgog's Shelter, Alta Gladium, and Hadrinium. Okay, cool. Um, I blah blah blah. Uh, I led them here to hunt down traitors, but we were betrayed in turn. I will not rest until I avenge such treachery. By the grace of the Triumvirate, I have the opportunity to do so. The Triumvirate are the three gods, by the way, um, of the Empire. So they uh, came in contact with the twelve, the Lich Lords of the New Empire. So they're they're the people who rule the Empire. 12 lich lords um, and some say they had a hand in preserving them turning them into liches three gods formed their own apparatus the three gods are Sergorod, Bal Urkal and Axul king of the underworld um, each god's church is responsible for some part of society Religious practices of triumvirate followers typically involve prayers, mass, sacrifices. Each time an imperial wants the help um, when it's required, sacrificing humans is forbidden. Okay, interesting. Mm, asking about the fight. Company was drawn here on false promises. We fought, fought with Sir God's rage, but there were just too many. Um, asking what he was doing here. I think we did that already. And my companions came in here in search of enemies of the Empire. Uh, it was supposed to be a last glorious battle in a long investigation, but it went out differently. The traitors we were supposed to apprehend lured us here, along with these un undead. Okay. Um, ask him about the Nightly Order. Blah, blah, blah. We're enforcers of the Empire. Ask him what he plans to do now. And tend to return to Avernum. I have to debrief my superiors there, um, and I want to look more into the uh, lead that that and ultimately brought me here. Mm. Yeah. So basically, you tell him you're going to Avernum. Good. I shall join you for the journey. The journey. Irophons teaches us to share the burdens of the road. Now tell your men to pile up the bodies of my companions. Burning them without the proper rituals is not becoming of such heroes of the Empire, but we have no time for much else. Also gather all their belongings while you're at it. Make it happen, Varkus. In the meantime, someone skillful enough should take a look at my wounds. You're about to leave to give orders when Sedaris calls after you. And just so everyone knows, the danger might still be looming over us. The traitors who I was supposed to find around here, keeping a distance. They surely would have finished me off had I managed to conquer all the undead by myself. I doubt they were going to make a move now that you are here, but who knows what their desperation will drive them to. Excuse me, keep yawning. 
Um, though your crew does not like to be ordered around, they agree. Um, Irophons is the saint of uh, the old Imperial religion um, called the Vagabond. <gasps> oh my god. Called the Vagabond. He's the one that looks after roads and travellers. His worship is very popular among the Vagri. Originally, Irophons was a man who visited every place yet never found what he saw until he realised he was drawn to the road itself. Strangely, his Cenobites have some magical powers in the post-Calamity era, even if not as potent as that as the priests of the Triumvirate. How interesting. So, Sidarius joins your Comitatus. Um, you can see he's holding something small. It's a fetish charm. Okay. <laughs> One that the kindly sisters and the disciples of Axel used to attract reanimated dead. I disabled it, don't worry. You give the charm back to the knight. Um, there was also the matter of the belongings of my fallen comrades. I expect you to hold on to them until we reach a Vernum. We'll discuss it there. Okay, cool. We get some Serodagite arms. The Dark Knight joined us after we rescued him from the clutches of the mindless undead horrors that slaughtered his companions. He was a grim sort, displaying no gratitude or companionship. Yet, we were stuck with him, for a lawman such as the knight could make his dreadful will ours by command. So we set out, bound for Avernum, the greatest city in the vicinity. Leader management is now active. Okay, so I'm actually going to take a little break here. Um, to give my voice a little rest, gonna get a coffee and uh, grab a quick bite to eat. So, um, probably be a few minutes uh, at least. Um, so I'll put my be right back screen on for you and I'll catch you guys in a bit. Okay, so we're back. Sorry about the break there, but um, needed to restock up and get some supplies. It is obviously, uh, you know, on a usual stream, we talk a lot, but this game is a lot. Like, there's so, if you really want to explore all the uh, different uh, aspects of the game, it really does get your voice a bit. Excuse me. Okay, so, um, leader management is now active. Click on the medallion. To open the leader window this is actually really cool this bit um but again a lot of information so we are called tiberius aburo we're a trader our ambition is wealth we're human and we're a veteran uh you have a few stats resourcefulness is like that thing that we can spend on stuff really useful you can increase it with insight which is like experience points authority is how many um kind of like captains we can have that's not really an important skill and then these are the perks um that you can put points into it's saying select purchase select and purchase the prepare leadership perk apparently this one so awesomeness to place a companion in the front of the initiative order in combat that's literally useless well it's not useless but i would much rather get traverse to be perfectly honest. Ah, oh, well, okay, fine. Leadership perks are perks specific to the Vargas. Each of them, this is really useful. All of these things are incredibly uh, good. Um, each of these... Let's you use uh, resourcefulness to boost your actions in certain ways. Um, you can hover over them and it tells you. It, from what I've seen so far, um, probably encourage is very good, um, especially when you're moving, because really you use a lot of resourcefulness when you're in cities and towns to do stuff. So I can see how in, actually I had enhanced in my last one and it was really good. So we want to get that one. Um, exploit doesn't seem that and Traverse is very good as well. So a lot of these are good. Um, yeah, I suppose that would be good too because it stops your companions from getting messed up. 
Authority, yeah, anyway, it's just telling us about that. Click the helmet icon um, on the leader medallion to navigate to the companions pane. Cool. So this is what we were looking at earlier in the combat. Um, you can review your companions and how good they are at certain stuff here. A lot of information. You don't really need to pay much attention to resistances. Um, but this is very useful because in this way you can decide whether you want them to evade our block. You can look at their power, um, initiative, accuracy, you know, their vitality, things like that. And these perks are also really useful. Um, and then these are the skills. So obviously sometimes in combat you'll have to check this to be like hmm you know should i use receding swing it's only 80 percent accuracy maybe it's better if i just use mind blast because it's basically you're sure to hit cut that kind of thing you know um the scroll icon at the bottom of the companion's image can be clicked to reveal their backstory oh, i didn't know that Says Yavik is of Tarkin origin, and though he seldom speaks of his past, you learn that he used to be a slave. Interesting. Yeah, I, I personally just find this character really cool. Um, I don't know why, but it feels like they, they just haven't bulked out more and as much. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's just me having a propensity for magic users. The pendant icon can be clicked to reveal gear. Okay, cool. So a lot of information here, but basically you can upgrade your characters here. Gives them proficiency, which is points to use in this. Yeah, that's basically it. You don't really need to know any more about the intricacies of this. Um, obviously, you can. you can, um, And if you want to, like, pause the stream or come back and have a look at this, you can obviously look into it um, as you wish. Yeah, um, upgrade Morwen's prowess, it's saying, so we're going to upgrade Morwen and purchase any perks or skills you'd like. Now, having done this before, combat skills and traits. Traits are really useful. Um, so you can choose where you move after a successful dodge is very useful. Although we would have to upgrade our dexterousness massively to actually get that. Die hard, good as well. Thick skull is pretty awesome. That would be strong minded two and tough three. So again, like all of these things are gonna cost us a lot. Um We already have Beast Law with Yavek. Um and we're gonna focus on that with him. So we don't need to worry too much about this. Um although all all of these skills professions are really useful in fairness. But I think we're gonna focus on her for combat. Um so we are gonna we're gonna try and Either upgrade one of these skills, we can't do that yet, or get one of these. So I think we'll try and get Dexterous 3, because there's a bit of an overlap between that with some of the other skills, I think. Yeah, that's Dexterous 1. Or we could try and go with Strong Minded. Immunity to Stun will be very good. I do like that though. Just seems like that would be something she would do. Um, so we're going to put our points into that for now. Placement is very important in combat. Okay, cool. Um, when finished, close the window. Okay, we've got seven points left. Four days. How far are we? I think when I played this last time, I starved my crew. Um, we are looking like that might happen to us. Um, we might want to march a bit, actually, um, and use up some march points. I 
think that's what we're going to do. Because we're four, four days. It's saying we're two to three days. It's saying we should be okay, though. Hmm. I think we'll camp. Oh, that's going to vigor us. So, also, there's no foraging anyway, so... Hmm. Okay, well, never mind. We've decided to do this now. We can buy some more uh, herbal supplies in one of the cities later on. So we're going to um, leave that for now. Okay, we'll just end the day. The whole comitatus becomes agitated as the dust cloud appears in the, in the east and starts to move towards you. You give orders to, uh, to your crew to prepare for a dust storm. Such a thing is fairly common, and you shall have little trouble traversing it. I think we've looked at this before, right? Um, one of the largest desert areas. Hmm. Yeah, not, not so much interesting stuff here. It's talking about the Sadira, who are tribal uh, people who live in this area. Um, the Voracious Desert is Arenas Vorax. It used to be dense forests and hills, but it was bombarded with fire from the sky during the Calamity. Legends say it was so devastating and hot that it turned the surface into glass, which was shattered and ground into fine sand. People who survived in shelters called tectums emerged hundreds of years after the cataclysm to take the area. They fought fierce battles with the saddened worms and now occupy the oases and underground cities that dot the endless dune sea. These territories are officially under empire control, but in truth, this is fairly loose. Oh dear. After half an hour, uh, the cloud is much closer, and you see now that we'll cross your path. By then, everyone is wearing um, protective masks or bandanas, and all the cargo and equipment are secured. Yavik is riding a large beast of burden, um, deep in concentration to maintain the calmness of all your animals. Something is off. An uncanny twilight is settling on the broken plains around you. It's much too early for sunset, and the storm should not be able to blow out the sun like this. And then you hear it, chanting. Chanting on the wind, and a pale light at the heart of the storm heading your way. You can see the faces of the crew slowly becoming distorted in panic. Okay, um, tch, 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 right. I don't, this is the last pilgrimage again, I think. Um, I think it would be stupid to fight it. I think we're going to die. Um, we do have movement points, so we could try and run away. Um, last time I think I hid, and that was fine. Um... But I think we'll flee. Oh. You're just about to give the order when Sidaris walks up to you. What is the meaning of this, Vargas? There's no need for such a disparate act. It's just a dust storm. You tell him quickly about your previous encounter with the last pilgrimage. Nonsense. The chances the pilgrims would show up again are... Sidaris trails off as an eerie twilight falls upon the Comitatus, and the dust cloud envelops you all. There's no time to flee or hide, so you signal everyone to draw weapons. Some of your crew tremble, some are praying, and some are about to speak. Um, but not Sidarius. The knight walks towards the approaching apparition as if been possessed by a death wish. You can see Yavik frowning and sweating in concentration, now don't trying to combat your beast's instincts to flee in utter terror. In a few moments, you hear the chanting and see the ghastly pilgrims clearly through the dust curtain, desiccated forms and faded robes shuffling among the broken terrain, or rather, over the terrain somehow, as if floating at a rapid pace. Their vacant faces are illuminated by pale, dreadful light that emanates from their hollow insides. You are paralyzed by terror. Blurred images enter your mind, visions of horrid processions of living dead wearing faded robes. You walk among them. You are. Is this the end? Before they can reach you, the spectral pilgrims turn left and head south among a dried out riverbed without any apparent reason. So basically, um, the last pilgrimage marches away and for some reason they change direction and didn't come towards you. Sidaris is, is, uh, walks over to us. Sergorod is with us. This is no one if ever I've seen one. 
My destiny for retribution against the enemies of the Empire must be why these horrors let us be. You swallow a nod, yet you're not certain why it happened. Rest assured, Vargas. As long as you have me by your side, no harm will come to your comitatus. Remember that. Okay, cool. We got plus five insight, which is boss. Still rattled. Uh, the danger's passed. Yavek. Um... <laughs> But you don't talk. Uh, you haven't heard of anyone encountering the last pilgrimage twice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, you know, lucky, I suppose. Or something. Who knows? How far away are we now um, from Avernum? We are... Five to seven days. What is this? No. That can't be possible. We were... what? No. What? I don't understand that at all. It said we were closer not too long ago. It's right there! What? Five to seven days? Five to seven days by us. Four to six days? What? What is this? What is this madness? I think there's some kind of glitch with the map or something, I don't know. Um, anyway, we will camp and see if we can get some food. Yep, we should be fine. Uh, we're running quite low on food, but I think we'll be okay. We'll try and heal more one again. Although the healing is really bad, like... How, how low is she on health? Eight. Well... Should probably just, um... Oh, the music's back. Yeah, I did. I don't know. I, I changed the. Um... Oh, how do we get rid of this? Okay. Um... Yeah, I think we're good. Let's do that. Hopefully, we get some food. We did. Uh, the hunting failed, though. Which is poor. Uh, but never mind. Two days. So we should hopefully be able to get there. If we go 9 and then 1, 2, 3, 1, 2... Yeah, how much is it? So it's 15 to Avernum, so... We'll do our full 9. We should actually get there. Like, when I played this out uh, in my previous heist, I managed to starve them, I think. Um, somehow. Yeah, we don't really want to use a bigger at this stage. Um, And then let's go straight into Avernum. Okay, things are going to start getting very interesting now. The Comitatus climbs the broken ridge and everyone stops for a moment to take in the visage of Avernum. Nestled atop and around a strange a range of large hills, chimneys of the city's many forges and smelters cast a dark shadow over it while the lava fields beyond the settlement provide an intense reddish glow. Um... As the backdrop, several crude roads meander among the hills here, probably leading to the mines and quarries you passed during the last day or so. Time for us to part ways, Fabrus. The voice of Sidarius makes you jump a little. For a large fellow wearing heavy armour, he managed to creep up on you without a sound. He's standing beside you, gazing at the horizon. I have to make my way into the city alone. My reasons are my own, but before I go, I have a proposition for you. You are well aware, of course, that my contingent was betrayed and ambushed out in the wasteland where we met. During our trek, I have come to the conclusion that whoever betrayed us had to be involved in the investigation I led in Avernum before setting out from the city. Even though I have some ideas where to start looking for traitors, the implications of this despicable betrayal are too severe to attempt to meet head on. I require secrecy and guile. Most of my reason remaining allies in the city and I are too easy to track or recognize, and those responsible could easily make evidence disappear. If I am revealed to be alive, someone else has to provide that guile for us. After a short pause, he looks him in the eye. What I mean is that you, your friend the mage, and the rest of your crew could be vital in finding the culprits and bringing them to justice. The Empire needs your help, Pagrus. Okay, uh, well... We are going to try and get some money out of this because we're looking pretty broke. So I think what we're going to do is 
we might actually ask him some questions. Maybe let's ask him what the betrayal implies. It implies um, that some of the officers were corrupted. Okay, cool. Um, ask him about the investigation he led in Avernum. I was summoned to the city by elements of the authorities. I was uh, to take a leading part in the series of investigations into abolitionist activity. Yes, Vargas, do not look so surprised. Slave lovers. Their despicable activities resulted in a whole group of these ingrates escaping their bonds and devolving into a banditry, preying on good citizens of the Empire, on Comet Arty, on people like you and your crew. I and my Sergoradite contingent managed to catch quite a few of them with the aid of local authorities. But the liberated tribe itself was out of our reach until we found a lead that we followed north to the area where we met. We were supposed to locate their hideout and deal with them in a permanent fashion. The rest is history. What's the liberated tribe? Groups of outlaws made exclusively of escaped slaves. Okay. Mm. Okay, he's going to need someone to spy on criminals, blah, blah, blah. I wonder what happens if we refuse. Like, I've never refused before. The thing is, you know, it's obviously trying to get us to, to go with him. Um, and also, he's a really powerful fighter in combat that we'll probably need later on. So, I think we will agree, but we'll say we want some money. Yes, I was expecting as much from the likes of you, but not Fred Vargas. I agree that loyalty and dedication to the Empire ought to be rewarded in some cases. You've already proven yourself useful, and I can assure you that the Order of the Black Sun shall not forget that. Neither your continued service. It may not be coin you get, but I think having the Order's support would be eternally more useful in your line of work around the Empire than any material riches. You tell him that such a pledge would be sufficient payment. He nods in agreement. Now let's just part ways and follow my plan. I want money! I don't want this rubbish! What kind of pledge? Give me the money! The plan for now is to make our ways into Avernum separately, so that you won't be associated with me at all. Rest assured that although they do not expect my return, the traitors would be informed at once had I turned up at the city gates. So I have to find an alternate way in. I will send for you once I'm settled in. Someone trustworthy shall appear and guide you to my... hideout. We'll take a talk about your tasks there. You ask him about the belongings of his former comrades, the Knight's Fran. That might complicate matters somewhat. Take their holy symbols to the Temple of Sergorod quietly. You can get rid of the weapons as you see fit, but I forbid you selling them at the market. It would attract too much attention. I sincerely hope I can trust you with this, Vargas. The war will betide you if you do not comply. With that, he takes leave of you and waits as you signal combatants as move forward. Right, so, a few things really important here. So, we're going to get the weapons. We need to remember this. We need to take the holy symbols to the Temple of Sergorod, but we can do what we want with the weapons. Now, I have an idea of what we might want to do with the weapons. We might want to smelt them down and then sell off the metal that we get from smelting them. So again, give us some cash. So we're going to do that. Okay, cool. Dark omens. Ominous apparitions of an otherworldly covenant of spectres. A grim night out for vengeance. Time and coin running out slowly. Yet against all odds, we journeyed to the city of Avernum on the Smolderbone Flats. A place bustling with travelers, merchants, and lowlifes. It was supposed to be a short stop on our way east, but we got more than we bargained for. Okay.
Having passed through the city, you arrive at Cobble Plaza. You head towards the Mancio, a large inn for Comitati. Uh, Mancio is a great inn, built to house Comitati. They're often circular with a spacious plaza in the middle. Um, the outer circle is jammed with service buildings, such as taverns, boardy houses, gambling dens and rooms. Uh, they can be quite varied, um, but they usually have the basic services you need. There's someone here to talk to see you, boss. Someone sent by a nightly friend. Say she wants to talk to you directly. She's waiting behind the stables. Okay. As you approach, she sh uh, throws the hood back, revealing the markings of someone in the service of Axul, god of the underworld. A face painted pale with dark eyeshadow to give the impression of a skull. You suspect she's a novice attached to the Order of the Black Sun or an acolyte of the Church of the Axul. There's nobody nearby. Greetings from our mutual friend, the Knight Dominus, the young woman says quietly and after looking you in the eye. I was sent here to take you to him when you're ready. I'll wait here, just don't take too long. He's very eager to see you. Okay, we're going to read these infos. Axul is king of the underworld and the god of death. A member of the Triumvirate, the official religion of the Empire. He looks after the dead and their souls. His church is among the strongest in the Empire, justifying the notion that Imperials have become death cultists. It is also the least corrupt of the religious institutions by far. And the disciples of the Grim Lord are reputed for their silence, discreet manners and grim empathy even. Axel is believed to be the first being ever to have truly died, and thus is theorised to have been around much longer than his appearance right after the Calamity. His church is tasked with facilitating all funerals, burials, and with the overseeing of graveyards and crypts. Additionally, at times of war, the risen legions of Axel, called to unlife by his dead priests, make up the backbone of Imperial armies. My god! According to legend, Axel contacted the Twelve just after the Calamity and offered them his aid in rebuilding the Fallen Empire. They accepted and the King of the Underworld has been their closest ally ever since. Some folks even claim he had a hand in resurrecting the Apostles as liches, even though this miracle is attributed to the Emperor. In dogma. With so many dead due to the Calamity, Axel and uh, his follow following took among themselves to give proper rest and relief to the tortured souls. Even these days, the dead are respected by Axolites, and without proper rights, the souls are said to remain behind in the Riven Realms, suffering for eternity, instead of taking its place in Tartarus, the underworld, in Imperial religion. The gigantic Acropolises of the Southern South are looked after by Axolites. Axel's priests have power over life, force, and souls. They're necromancers. Um, Without priests and necromancers, there isn't dead or any husks controlled by malevolent instincts, so they're needed when undead are used as workforce or fighters in the Legion of the Empire. Undead without an independent mind that are not controlled by a believer or a licensed necromancer are sought out and destroyed by the church. The King of the Underworld is depicted as a tall road man with a skull face and a hood. Sometimes he holds a sickle, other times he stands a pile of bones. Axel, tem Axel temples look like great crypts or mausoleums and often serve as such. Their funeral services performed in them, an ossuary. I actually have no idea what that word means. Os ossuary. Hmm, interesting. White marble is often used for building materials of Axel temples. Cool. Um, and then the Church of Axel is the religious institution of the God of Death. Um, it does the things that we just read about. Uh, the church, the priests are tasked with supplying undead. They wield great political and magical power, often holding seats in the Senate. The head of the church is the vicar, who's usually the most gifted and experienced necromancer. All priests are as novices and go through training. The church has close ties to the Ordis Negris Solis, so that's the, um, what's it, Sidaris's order, which is the Empire's greatest knightly order. It's said that Sergorod has much more influence over the Black Knights' um, agenda, and that Axolites do not care. Church has two major and well-known sects, the Watchers and the Apothecaries. The former is a military group tasked with the protection, while the latter is a group sworn to use all their knowledge. Um, I lost where I was reading. Yeah, in medicines and physiology. Okay, so the Church, but two major and well-known sects, the Watchers, who are a military group, and the Apothecaries, who heal people. Interesting. The Church has a lot of temples. The major ones are... The Imperial City, and in Devon, 
and in Charnel Valley. Okay, cool. So, Yavik, uh, I'll just summarize this. Yavik's basically saying we should smelt down some of the scrap metal um, because it takes less um, space and we can sell some of it. It was a loss in the long run, but we have to pay the crew. So, I don't want to spoil anything, but I've played like 20 hours of this and I am nowhere near Devon. So, from my... from what I've looked at, it seems very useful to smelt down a lot of the scrap metal, um, to be honest. Oh, we've got the Mancio pain, apparently. The Mancio pain. Uh, when you rest in the Mancio, the day ends and you've got a day, an end day scene. You can see your Comitatus crew pain. You can hire crew as well as buy beasts. Switch between crew and beasts with the buttons at the top. Uh, ta um, this is locked. Okay, cool. Um, rumors could be purchased here. Um, these bits of information can unlock points of interest on your chart, tip you off on business opportunities, or give you hints of, on storylines. Purchase rumors can be found in your journal. Passengers can sometimes be found in Mancios. When taken to their destination, they reward you. Uh, click exchange news to tabble to local sources. Uh, some people might pay you, some people won't. Okay, so we're going to do a few things. We're going to take on this passenger. We're going to exchange news. We're going to buy all these rumours. We're going to sell some slaves, because we have a lot of slaves. We don't really need all of these slaves. We do need more fighters, but do we need them now, is the question. Um, okay, well, let's figure out what we want to do first. We still don't, there's still, I feel like we still got a lot of slaves. They're just driving up our consumption. We probably want to sell more of them. You don't get much of an opportunity later on to actually sell them, so I think we'll do that. Um, okay, so uh, let's, we're going to do a few things first. So we're going to go explore the city and go for a walk so you can get some really cool events. You find a small drug den tucked away in an alley. Upon entering, you're greeted by a half elf with a sleazy smile and a powerful smell of bogweed. Bogweed is the name of a plant found in the swamps and is a recreational drug that is derived from the plant. It rose in popularity long before the calamity, but thanks to large areas turning to marshes, it become more widespread. It can be taken by smoking or as a potion or vaporizing in an Atakian hookah. Some food recipes also exist that utilize bogweed, but these are rare. Uh, it gives a calm, meditative state, um, not technically legal, um, any underworld organisations would smuggle it. Okay, I've done this before, um, I feel like this is bad, but some bogweed is actually good because it's going to give us a buff, so we'll do that. It gives us some insight, which is always good. Okay, so that's we've done that for today, we can't explore it anymore. Um, we can go to the fighting pits and uh, bet, so we'll do that as well. We actually gained some money, but not great. Um, we will also go to the Medicos and see if we can get some herbs. Now, we have eight herbs. This is a lot lower than the normal price, so we're actually going to buy five more herbs, is what we're going to do. Um, <clears throat> I've never entered the roster before. I feel like that would be a bad idea, but who knows? We could maybe do that later. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to pour myself a drink. My voice is really struggling. So we're going to seek out, uh, actually, you know what we'll do, we'll go to the temple first. The temple of Axel, king of the underworld, is a small one, but the necropolises around it make up for its size. 
the whole area looks deserted. Um, glum looking novices and great units work without a word. Uh, robe priests whisper to each other in alcoves and corridors. Uh, Reanimated undead shuffled towards some unsaid task. The insides of the temple look like a crypt too, but with many wall slots for bones. Okay, um, let's ask some stuff. So we're going to ask the priests about the bones in the city walls. You could walk up to a priest and ask him about the bones embedded in the city walls. Are they maintained by the followers of the god of death? Is Axel not angry? Hmm... The great king is not offended, because not only do we tend to the bones, but they are considered to be resting. You see, these bones were brought here from the plains of bone, where they are lying for who knows how long unattended and forgotten. Now they have a purpose. They remain unadorned and empower our walls. They may not be interred or burned to ash, but were given proper ritual, and the great king gave permission for their use. It is no different from the way we use the corpses of those who give us permission, and of those who, well, of the enemies of the Empire. Necromancy was used to strengthen the bones too, and grim surprises await those who would be foolish enough to scale and attack these walls. Oh god, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we've got a couple of things here. The Plains of Bone, a rocky region. Uh, many creatures uh, of the surrounding regions came here to die, so it has a morbid look and a poor reputation. Covered with rock um, and pebbles, um, it's called the desert. It's called Plain of Bones. It's a grim place where light grey coloured sand goes on forever. It's very dry, um, and the wind rarely blows. Stench of rot is pervasive and never seems to go away. Um, a vast number of bones have piled up to form natural sepulchres over the plains. Um, all these bones have been accumulated for hundreds of years. The innate curse of the region slows down the degradation to the point where you can find hundreds of years of old bones still intact out in the open. Interesting. When the Calamity struck the lands around the great imperial city of Madrios, um, only a dry washed out desert remained in place of the rolling plains and gentle hills there. The city itself was abandoned and following the chaotic first century post-Calamity, the Skortar appeared in and around Madrigos. These despicable savage man-scorpion mutants renamed the place Scorponar and began their reign of terror over the plains. They used the bones and ivory of the plains to craft weapons and tools and have proven impossible to exterminate. The Plains of Bone is a veritable graveyard of creatures, both large and small. Often very old dragons come here to die too and challenge anyone they find there so they will fall in battle. Those who dare risk entering can come back with a lot of valuable bone and ivory, but only if they do not roll foul of the Scortar or some dying monstrosity. Such prospecting is frowned upon by the authorities in general, as it was proven it provokes the ire of the man-scorpions, who in turn raid nearby realms. Okay, wow, great. Um, and then there's a big article here on necromancy. Uh, magical art of sensing, manipulating, substituting, and altering the life of living beings. Although categorized as dark magic and consequently stigmatized all over the known world, the Empire uh, is unique in its acceptance and usage of these powers, so much so that in fact that Imperials are often considered death worshippers by other cultures. This is because Axul, arguably the most prominent god of the Empire, is king of the underworld, a god of death in part responsible for undead beings reanimated by necromancy. The church's stance on these arts is quite rigid. Only such magic performed by their members or sanctioned by their members is lawful. Unsanctioned undead have to be eliminated, as they profane the holy act of reanimation. Priests of death, go uh, death gods and sorcerers alike can perform necromantic magic, which is thusly one of the unique arcane arts. Consequently, the Church of Axel and independent licensed necromancers can teach those uh, with a talent in the dark arts. The most well-known form of necromancy is the reanimation of the dead, but most practitioners reach that advanced level after mastering simpler spells, um, like ones that allow the strengthening of necromantic flesh, talking to the spirits of the dead, sensing life force, or disabling undead. The absolute epitome of necromancy is the ability to, res to resurrect the a dead person into an undead body, but that is something beyond the reach of all the, but the most powerful. Sages theorise that this is because doing so requires one to manipulate souls, which is beyond the scope of necromancy, and delves into what is considered demonic magic. It's known that the Twelve, the Lich Lords of the Empire, grant this boon of conscious undeath to their most loyal servants. Wow, okay. So they're obviously very powerful mages. Um, necromancers can serve the Empire in many positions. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, cool. Okay.
Um, what else do we need to ask? At the Prisba Axel. I love this. You ask a friendly death priest. <laughs> okay. Um, Axel's the god of death, king of the underworld. Ultimately ruling over all monarchs and death, except perhaps the emperor who's thought deathless. I don't get it. There is an emperor still? I thought they were just the 12 lich lords. That's interesting. The elder god of death was Tanat. Used to be a chieftain. He became a grim deity after accepting the task of overseeing the dead from Zin, king of the elder gods. Um, thus he became ruler of Tataris. Tanat was well respected and, fer and fervently worshipped, if obscure. Um, yeah, he left this reality along with the rest of the Elder Gods after the Calamity. Axel overtook Tanat's duties and powers. Okay, so Tataris became a, a realm of the dead and, and a prison for many unwanted beings, especially demons. Um, thus, Lower Tataris has formed into a bottomless chasm called the Abyss, where these terrible things are chained. Um, so, after the Calamity, some of the demons attacked worlds and made plans to free their pro progenitors. Axel has looked after the souls of the dead. Interesting. So he says here, Axel is not an angry or evil god. He's the caretaker of souls. And one that gives peace to mortals after they die. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, visit the Great Ossiary. The Great Ossiary is a system of labyrinthine tunnels and dark halls carved into the earth and rock beneath the Acropolis. Many of the more wealthy are interred here, as it is believed they are closer to Tataris and Axel this way. Many of the Ossiary is off limits, but a large section can be visited by the public. You walk through the vast halls lift, lit by a thousand candles and filled with the remains of tens of thousands. Most of these bones are placed in racks or intricately carved stone slabs. Novices tend to the most recent or the oldest ones. The halls are kept very clean and the air is cool inside. You find yourself sitting on a stone bench and walking aimlessly, reading long inscriptions of names and deeds carved into the arches that lead to the private crypts. The whole place makes you calm and contemplative. Oh wow, we got some insight. That's cool. Buy some trinkets. Hmm. What does this do? Ooh, it gives a die-hard perk. So, admittedly our money's pretty rough, but we will get a lot of money when we um, sell off some of our iron. So we're actually going to buy this candle um, and leave the necropolis. And then what we'll do is we're going to equip it to uh, because it'll give die hard which is um, when you get down you come back with it so that's going to be useful for us let's go meet score now then A sleepy-looking Jajmahan guard lets you into a back room, uh, but Yavik has to stay outside. Um, basically, we find this guy, Skorna, who's a tall man with red hair. Um, he's got tattoos, he's wearing a bronze best breastplate, he has an impressive bearded axe with an iron head. Um, you feel he's a dangerous man. I don't know what voice to do for him. Welcome, Vargas. I am the one called Skornar, the Blue Feast, he says. You do not mention that his face appears to be human colour. I have been expecting someone with a delivery. He sits down across you and pours some of his ale, smiling. Can I have it? No. You hand him the package. We get some insight. Brilliant. Skornar smiles mischievously as he unwraps the leather package and observes a golden ring dedicated, decorated with silver symbols. He wraps it again and pockets it. Just checking if it's genuine. More for the craftsman's sake than yours, he says upon seeing your quizzical expression. He salutes you with his own mug and drinks up. You join him. I'm grateful to you, friend, for your part in this, 
I'm sure Narbo compensated you somehow. However, you might want to do business with me later, nonetheless. You'll find that I can help you with lots of things in the city. I have to leave now, but I'll see you around, eh? With that, Skona leaves the room. Cool, okay. Yes, so we got some insight again. Um, so, we're, we're totting up quite a lot of insight at this point, and we probably want to think about using it for something. Um, so there's various things we can do with it. Um, I think what we'll probably do, though, is we are probably coming up towards the end of the stream. So what I'll do is we're going to write a little notification, a uh, kind of reminder for me for next time, uh, which will be next week, to, um, to do that. So next week we will upgrade. Uh, so use Insight. I do have to finish the current day though, um, because otherwise we won't um, it won't save and we'll lose what we've done. But we'll keep that for the next day, if you like. Um, we're gonna go. We I don't think we want to visit the sorcerer yet. No, we don't need him. Um, did we go to the S temple of Sergorod? Sergorod to grant you power. Okay. Oh, deliver the belongings of Sidaris's companions. We need to do that, but only um, give them the holy symbols. We're not going to give them the weapons um, because we're going to do something with them, make some money. Hmm. So well, now we've given the symbols back, we can get this buff. But again, we don't want to get this buff until we leave Avernum. So. Um, we might even want to do that later because we might not need it yet um, but anyway we, we will do that somebody remember to remind me before we leave Avernum next week we need to do that um, but we're not going to do that now Let's go and visit Sidarius. Hmm, he won't pay us this, that's interesting. Because before I've managed to get him to pay that. Um, we need the enhanced leadership perk. Um, well, in fairness, that is probably one of the things we want to do anyway. Doesn't seem like we can do it now, though. Well, the gate text isn't that much anyway. Um, I'm not going to do all this rubbish right now. I'm just going to do that just to trigger this stuff. Um, oh, wow, I've never read this before. Emperor Valen Zavaris, the immortal emperor, protector of the people, the deathless, the divine son of Zin, the king of the Elder Gods, has been the sovereign of the Empire for over 2,000 years. What? Ever since his self-sacrifice during the Calamity and his subsequent comatose state, he's been unable to rule Hover. 2,000 years? Oh my god. He's the son of Zin. And the king of the Elder Gods. Oh, he's the son of Zin, the king of the Elder Gods. Um, his most trusted servants, the Apostles, took on the burden of governing the Empire. It might also behoove any historian or lawmaster to know that even before the Calamity, his Imperial Majesty had been rather distant from state affairs and politics in general. This sounds fishy to me. And was mostly occupied with overseeing the construction of the Cathedral of Ascendancy in the capital, as well as uh, various mysterious passion projects. Thus, the Apostles have been quite prepared for taking over the rule of the Empire in his absence. Imperial tradition states that the Golden Age has been going on for a thousand years at the end of the Third Age. This exquisitely prosperous and blessed period occurred on behalf of the gods themselves. They were the ones who guided Vale and Zavaris, the Immortal Emperor. Zavaris ascended to the Imperial Throne over a thousand years before the Calamity. Him not growing old, or in fact, not aging at all, was not a natural phenomenon, and the people of the Empire started to grow suspicious at first. However, the clergy soon declared that Valen Zavaris is a direct descendant of the gods themselves, the son of Zin, the supreme god and king of the Pantheon. The Emperor was thus seen as a demigod, and his popularity grew exponentially in the first few years of his rule. 
Supported unquestionably by the clergy, His Divine Majesty performed miracles on a daily basis, refreshing political reforms, sensitive social engineering, economic boom, game-changing inventions, glorious military victories, and divine interventions were among the many things attributed to Zavaris. The true extent of his involvement is impossible to say, but there's no doubt that under his rule the Empire rose to be the greatest power in the whole world. The Emperor started to withdraw from public after the first 700 years of his rule and was occupied with mysterious projects for the betterment of the Empire. He was absent in the centuries prior to the Calamity and only appeared to defend the people of the capital and the heartlands when the Elder Gods struck. His self-sacrifice saved most of the regions from arcane destruction, but the conceivable, inconceivable magic and energies harmed him so badly he fell into a stasis and has not woken up ever since. Most Imperials believe that the day will come when he will again walk among them and lead the Empire to a new golden age. Until then, he's slumbering in the Cathedral of Ascendancy, the very sight of his stand against the treacherous Elder Gods. And the only the Twelve, as well as the highest ranking Axel Priests, can see him. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting. It's just a bit about his past, we don't really need to read that. Um, he doesn't tell us anything useful anyway. Let's report to him. Um, let's just begin, Vagrants. There's no time to waste. He's clearly on edge. When I arrived here on request of the Order to root out the abolitionists plaguing the region, we assumed that there were no more than well-organized gangs laying ambushes of travelers out in the wasteland. Perhaps some idealists and bored aristocrats in the city uh, aid Escaped slaves that joined their ranks, but nothing more. A nuisance. Now I am absolutely sure that quite a lot of powerful people are involved in this whole mess, since they had the audacity and resources to set a trap for my contingent. That required coordination between the slaves and the slave lovers. Therefore, I conclude that the people my initial investigation involved had to have been in cahoots with the abolitionists. You need to find them and learn all you can about what they are hiding. Because we are dealing with powerful people, you need to apply subterfuge. There are three sources you have to investigate. These three targets were all close to the lead that guided us to the ambush. Okay, there's a little thing about abolitionists. I say little, it's very, very long. Um, so, abolitionists are people that go against slavery. Uh, it was a movement that existed in the Third Age, but... It's been outlawed in the Fourth Age by the um, the Twelve. It's still around, though, in the uh, regions outside. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so what I'm going to do is... We're gonna, I'm going to summarise these texts rather than read them all. So basically, Sadaris is going to give us uh, three jobs. Uh, we have to hunt down three different people. The first one is an assistant magistrate who was assigned to my cohort. He was a uh, mouthpiece for the Prefectus. We have to go to the Slag Fort and report to the officials that you have information about Sidarius, and that will probably get us an audience with Daro. Um, then we need to tell him that we kept we saw battle and tell him that Sidaris wasn't there. What wasn't his Sidaris's body wasn't there. Um he wants Yavek to read his mind when we're doing that. Second target. Um the Centurion. Centurions are officers in the Imperial Army. Uh Vardis Pendius, a drunkard. Um Yeah, Pendius made it back after some battle that was either outlaws or liberated slaves, and now he's enjoying leave of duty. Um, we need to know about these matters. Um, but he made lip let slip who made him lie in the court. So basically, Vardis Pendius was on a uh, a job. He bumped into what's likely freed slaves, but he was forced to lie about it 
in the courts by somebody. That somebody could be who we're looking for. The third target is the Smelters Collegium. A Collegium is an Imperial Association, a kind of guild. Um, Collegia come from the early days of the Third Age. They were given rights and obligations. Um, the institution soon spread. Collegia are rarely involved in civic duties and uh, rights protecting organisations only on the service. They oversee all criminal activity, including racketeering, uh, prostitution, smuggling, fencing, burglary, begging, gambling. They often have a great say in mercenary work. They sound a bit like criminal guilds. Yeah. So, basically, the Smelters Collegium run half the city, supposedly. They could have been used to help the abolitionists. They won't speak to him, but they might speak to us, bribe them, or use telepathy. One of the headquarters is a tavern called Gallows Anvil. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, so let's leave the hideout. And what we can do is, um, we can do one investigation and then we will have to sleep anyway so we're gonna do we do actually need to smelt some stuff down though to be honest um so maybe we'll do that first Oh, this is what we need to do. Talk to the smiths about me equipment made of metal. So we're going to place an order for these reinforced carts because they're really good. Um, it'll take three days to complete. We've done that. We'll have to pay them later on. Okay, come back later. Cool. Um, we can smell down the arms and armor of the dead Sergeridites. We're going to do that for the first thing. And... We're also going to smelt some metal scraps into ingots. Now, this is a tricky decision that we need to make because obviously the quest that Tiberius is doing is that he's trying to get some metal scraps down to Devon. But the thing is, for Lurg, it doesn't really, it's actually not that beneficial for us to smelt a lot, a lot more money wise. It makes basically no difference. Um, anyway, let's smelt a larger amount for now. And then see how we get on. So, oh. Yeah, we messed up because we didn't sell some stuff from our inventory um, before doing that. So we're going to lose some stuff that we picked up. Um, which is really, really annoying. They should give you an opportunity to um, trade like sell items like this i don't know why they don't do that it's really quite annoying uh, but i suppose it's just the way it goes sometimes anyway let's we'll do that then we'll sell off these i think actually hides aren't aren't that profitable here um if we're selling them in a vern oh no hides are good here so we're going to sell hides and i think metal scraps are in demand so we're just going to sell that just to free up that space in our inventory. Um, Metal-wise, uh, it's actually better for us to hold on to this metal and sell it in Utvorar and Vitrar, who are, which are places that um, are... I don't know how we have information on those. I think that's some other kind of glitch, because we've actually never been there, technically. Um, at least, we haven't in this playthrough but i have in previous playthroughs that's odd okay mm, maybe we're getting it from like somebody i don't know who knows weird okay we're gonna get some other things as well so we're gonna buy
plus seven beast cargo. What we're probably going to do is buy hunting animals. Because they're cheap. Won't let us equip them for some reason. That's weird. Usually there's a spot like up here where you can put them. That's odd. Okay. I don't know. Um, and probably we want to buy something else. We probably want to get extra storage. I know that's really expensive, but storage is going to be a massive issue for us um, in the in the whole of the prologue. Um, whoa, that's so good. Oh, it's only mounts and outriders, though. Okay, we're going to buy this. Did it actually give us more? doesn't seem like it did. That's weird. Oh, I see. You can you can put more. Okay, that doesn't really help us that much. It says what it costs. Um, but never mind. Um, cool. And then we'll sell off some of this other stuff. Iron, bronze, copper. Bronze is definitely worthwhile keeping. So is iron. Um, but we do need to sell something. We can't keep all of this stuff. We might be best selling off... Hmm. We need to pick one of these things to sell. I th I'm thinking we sell off these three bits of copper and we keep the bronze. So let's do that. Um, just to get us a bit of money back. Yeah, okay. This is actually, in my personal opinion, the funnest part of the game. I uh, like to get all the upgrades and paying stuff. Money-wise, we're not really in that great of a position. I would like to have more, but... Um, also, buying standard armaments would be pretty amazing. Um, but we could always do that later. We also we are going to need to buy some fighters as well, because six is way too low. Um, but we'll, we'll deal with that later on. Um, we're going to investigate one of the leads, because um, we can do one a day. So we're going to do one, then we're going to rest. So we're just going to do an easy one, which is the Centurion. The Risty Pugio is a fairly clean establishment, um, that does not mean regulars are well behaved. The legionnaires passed out on a bench. Uh, we find him. Sit next to him and buy him a drink. Let's talk to the bartender first. Ooh, I didn't do this last time. This was a clever idea. The bartender leans closer to you. Uh, the bartender leans closer as you gesture to her large shoulders and a legionnaire tattoo, indicating she's a veteran. You tell her that you wish to spice up Pendius's drinks, but mean no harm. Good luck with the old boozer if you think that'll get him smashed, but why would I help? Convince the bartender to spice up Pendius's drinks from now on. We bribe her, or... Um... Six changer, that's okay. Um... We're gonna do that, though. So we're gonna... Yeah, we're going to get him battered. Um, oh god, we have to use more usefulness to do this. Oh man, this is taking our money, but okay. Okay, Pendius has formal resilience, yet you manage to get him blind stinking drunk. You also guide the conversation to his notorious patrol to the north that only he survived. Not even his intoxication can hide his fear when he talks about the recon mission. Not what what you think it was. Trust you, power boys deserved not fish. He laments. You could swear there are tears in his eyes. He mumbles about the whole affair not being what it seemed. Soon afterwards, you excuse yourself, but by then, Pendius is in a non-coherent way. Anyway, um, okay. I don't really. Did we actually gain anything from that? 
Yavik read his mind. We didn't need to get him drunk, that was so dumb. Oh well, whatever. He's clearly paranoid, he recalls his comrades being killed, but not out there in the wastes. It happened in some kind of death trap in a large room. All young recruits. What are you laughing at? I thought my drunk impression was brilliant. I think they publicly set up his patrol only to kill off everyone uh, but him and told him to pretend they got slaughtered by abolitionists in the north. Basically, they created a fake story to make our knightly associate and his cronies think that they were going to find a camp there. It boggles my mind how far they went to protect something. He kept thinking about Scoria, a district here in town. Maybe the massacre was done there. Hmm, okay, so we did actually learn something from that. Now, if I remember correctly, we've already done that. Um, we can't investigate another lead, so we're gonna rest for the day. We really have lo no supplies, though. Oh man, that's still expensive. Two is still expensive. Oh, we're gonna be so broke. Oscar winning. Yeah, I thought so too. Well, we have to buy supplies here regardless. Okay, that could have been worse. That could have been worse. I think it's because we, we got rid of some of our slaves. I, in the last run I did, I just kept loads of slaves and it's just basically pointless. Okay, yeah, so let's... um. So I'm going to write a few things down that we need to do next week. So we need to use Insight. We need to go to Sergrod to get power. We need to buy fighters. Um... We need to... And then continue the investigation. We might want to buy something else as well. Like, we've got a couple of slots here. So buy new... trade, Buy trade goods. Although... I don't know. We'll, we'll have a think about that. Maybe. Um, and then the last thing we want to do is uh, continue investigation. Okay. Brilliant. Um, and then what we'll do is we're going to sleep. Yeah, we'll, we'll upgrade the companions next time because we've got loads of insight. Um, that we need to do. I think we're probably going to use that on Enhanced, though, um, because that's really, really useful. Hmm, that might be good, too. Okay, anyway, how do we sleep again? In the Mansio. Here we go. Need to heal more when still. Not looking too good. Oh, another thing you can do is, um, for one Vigor... Uh, you can uh, do something in town to gain a little bit of money. Now, we're really broke, so we're going to do this, even though it takes one vigor off. Because uh, we're going to be spending a few days here, so I think that's probably worthwhile. Um, we might want to boost up our rations. That's going to cost us money. Um, that gives us one vigor. That's actually pretty good. This one's okay. We might want to pay a good night's sleep in the Manchio's rooms. I'm gonna. We're gonna end up selling off a lot more metal uh, before we leave here because we're too broke. I shouldn't have bought though that those um, bags. Basically, that was a faux pas. But it will help us later on, so it's not gonna be the end of the world. I don't want to do that one though. That's too much. We don't need all that. And also, vigor's probably important right now. So anyway, let's do this um, and I don't know, do we actually just want to upgrade our Vigor instead of doing this? Is there really any any reason why? Oh, uh, let's do it. We actually got quite a lot of money, so that was good. Okay, cool. And that should have saved the game. Yeah, save game, new day. So. We're going to call it there, guys. Um, thanks so much for joining me. Um, I had a great time. This game is absolutely amazing. And I'd recommend anybody who can get a hold of it. Um, it was on sale a little while ago, which is how I got, got it. Um, so go wishlist it. Um, and obviously keep your eye on it. 
um, if you can, because it's great. This is only the prologue. We played three hours, and we barely, barely even touched the surface. Um, so it's a very deep game with a massive amount of lore. Um, you can tell my voice is destroyed from reading this out, though. So, um, yeah, anyway, but thanks so much. I have um, had a great time, and I will catch you all on Wednesday for some more Dwarf Fortress.